Dr. Woodson, uh, our presenters in particular, and also the USU extended community, welcome to the next 50 years of innovation. Innovation, creativity, these bring to mind people thinking about things, ideas, and then literally doing something about it. Uh, what also comes to mind is the very close similarity between the words aha and ha ha. Aha is obviously that these gifted individuals have experienced the insight to bring about a discovery and literally translate it into something that we can understand that has benefit, particularly to our warfighter community. Uh, the ha ha. Sometimes that's what you encounter when you first bring these things into the uh, visibility of the public because it can't happen. It's not going to work. But to their credit, to the four speakers today, that obstacle, that attitude did not dissuade them. It'll become readily apparent that they have taken what was a aha into something tangible, something we can understand, something we can be thankful that they've devoted their energies to. We have four speakers today. I will introduce the first, and upon her conclusion, I will introduce the second. And then, as I say, there'll be some changes in MCs. So it's my pleasure first to introduce Dr. Dugan, Dr. Kerry Dugan. She is currently the director for the Biological Technology Technologies, Technologies Office the, and DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research um, Projects Agency. She began her career at the FBI and for seven years there, she worked on various, I would say, chemistries related to genomics. Subsequent to that, she worked at the ODNI Intelligence Community Postdoctoral Research Fellowship Program. She knows a lot about mentorship and about bringing along the next wave of researchers. She also, before coming to DARPA, served in several leadership roles at the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency since 2007. Most recently, she was the senior scientist for the analysis directorate. She also led the research directorate's environment and cultural uh, pod, where she developed multidisciplinary research programs to understand how the effects of complex natural systems and cultural dynamics impact national security. Dr. Kerry Dugan, thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you for the, the very kind introduction and especially for inviting me to, to join you today. I'm excited to be here I think that the, the next 50 years of innovation are, are incredibly exciting. Um, so today, uh, my plan is to tell you a little bit about DARPA, a little bit about the Biological Technologies Office, and because that is such a mouth, mouthful, we call it BTO. And so I'll say BTO a lot. And then I want to tell you a little bit about some of the programs that, that we have going on that I think you will be excited about. And ending with a little bit of, of transition opportunities and things that we have in the works so that we can actually bring the, the research that we're developing into things that you all in your community can use. So, oops, is, is this advanced slide? Sorry. Next, please. I'll go with that. All right, so first, a little bit about DARPA. I, I suspect that, that many of you may be familiar with DARPA, but was, DARPA was started back in, in 1958 in response to the then Soviet Union, Union beating the United States to space with the with Sputnik satellite. And at the time, the DARPA was set up. The, the idea was that we would never again be strategically surprised by technology. And so DARPA was formed to both create and prevent strategic surprise in support of national security. Next, please. So as DARPA sits right now, we have six technology offices and I'll leave them on the screen. I'm not gonna to talk to each one of them, but they span everything from 
you know, biology in, in BTO to, to math and quantum science, all the way through to tactical systems. What we all have in common are, are a number of things, that goal to prevent and create strategic surprise, the idea that we sponsor high risk, high reward research. We fail fast. So if something isn't going to work, we wanna, we wanna push hard and find out and move on to the next challenge. Some of those wins, some of those risks really pay off. DARPA has in, in the, the portfolio of, of wins, things like the, the creation of GPS, stealth coatings for airplanes, even the first algorithm that became Siri that you know, we all have on our, our iPhones. We also have the, to our credit, initial investments into mRNA technology to be used for vaccines. DARPA doesn't have physical lab space. We fund research and the researchers that we fund do all this work. We guide their research through a, a strict set of milestones and metrics so that we can assess what's going on and figure out if the risk is still worth the reward. So we go to the next slide. I'll give you an example. So we all know about RNA now. Um, I would say that four years ago, if I were to talk to people, maybe not this crowd, but uh, most people, I wouldn't be able to use the word RNA and I wouldn't be able to use PCR. Thankfully, or potentially really more unfortunately, we, we now all know those words. Um, but an example of a, a big win that has come out of this DARPA model of investment is the RNA vaccines. So back in 2011, DARPA started investing in, an, in mRNA and actually DNA technology for the use of, of vaccines. So 2011, now that was 11 years ago. So I think that the idea that research does take time to, to come to fruition is one that I want to make for this slide. Also, the idea of high risk, high reward, and the, the slow, steady progress toward meeting those milestones and metrics. So you'll see on the timeline here, started in, in 2011 and 2013, funded Moderna for the first time when they were a very small company out of Boston. Then by 2014, we, we tested some, some DNA encoded vaccines for Ebola. And then in 2019, in, uh, tested a uh, RNA encoded antibody for chikungunya virus. We all know that in, in 2020, as, as part of the, the COVID response, RNA vaccines were developed not only by Moderna, by, 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 uh, by Pfizer and others, to, um, to push those this technologies forward into clinical trials, gain emergency use authorization and then FDA approval. So the question is really, how do we do this? And if we go to the next slide, I can talk about the Heilmeier Catechism. So if you read these questions, you'll see they're really just a series of sensible questions you might ask yourself when you're embarking on, on solving any problem. You know, what are you trying to do? What problem are you trying to solve? Right? If you can't say that, and if you can't communicate it clearly, chances are you're, you know, you're gonna have a hard time solving that problem. The next question is how is it done now? And what are the limitations, right? Why can't we do it better? And then the third one is, is one of the ones that I find most exciting. What's new now? Why do we think that we can overcome those limitations? What technological advances have happened recently that make us think now is the time? And in our case, now is the time for DARPA to invest in this technology. And of course, we need to know who cares. At DARPA, we're not going to do things that don't have national security impact. And so we need to know that we have a trans transition partner who cares about what we're doing and wants to adopt it if we're successful. And then finally, you know, milestones, metrics, you know, money, and, and you know, the, the like. So if we go to the next slide. 
particularly in BTO, another thing that we think about are the ethical, legal, and societal implications of any technology that we develop. We want to make sure that we're considering things like um, consent, character, and, and equity. Right? As we develop new technologies, are they going to have an impact on the, the character of a person? Because we, we don't want to change the character of a person. If we develop technologies, are we going to inadvertently create haves and have nots when some people have access to the technology and, and others don't? And so early in our programmed conception, as we're thinking about the Heilmeier Catechism, we're also thinking about the LC implications. And we work with experts in the field who work with us on a, a voluntary basis to make sure that we're thinking through all these perspectives as we develop our programs. Let's go to the next slide. This is our BTO overview slide. It is a little busy, but I'm going to walk us through it. So overall, the goal of BTO is to develop technologies that leverage biology to help the Sorry, to develop capabilities that leverage biology to help the warfighter. It, it, it's pretty simple. We, are, we approach our research in a multidisciplinary way. Our, our program managers come from all backgrounds, and our program managers are the ones who come up with these research concepts. So we bring together a lot of chemistry as well as math, in addition to our biology and engineering. We have a, a lot of efforts that include computation and AI, and I'll talk about some of those as we go through our uh, the slides. In order to, to discuss our, our programs, our 40 plus programs in a, in a somewhat manageable way, we divide them into three thrust areas that I show around the edges of the slide. And those are detect and protect, warfighter readiness, and operational biotechnology. And Detect and Protect largely focuses on things like ChemBio protection, where we're looking to detect and diagnose things and develop medical countermeasures. In warfighter readiness, we're interested in developing novel interventions to help the warfighter do their job and protect them. And in the neurotech portfolio, we're largely focused on restoration. And finally, in, in operational biotechnology, here, we're this taking a slightly different approach. And we're saying, how can biology help solve national security problems that aren't even biological in nature? And so this allows us to do things like look at logistics, help the warfighter move into different operational environments, can even help us address things like supply chain and environmental resilience. And so as I go through the subsequent slides in my talk, I'm going to cover programs from each of these thrust areas, largely focusing on detect and protect and warfighter readiness, because I think that's of, of greater interest to this audience. But as we're, we're pushing more and more into the operational biotech portfolio, I am going to include a couple of examples there. So next slide. When I was getting ready for, for this talk, I, I read your recent strategy document and I thought about how does BTO fit with that? And so the way we selected the programs that I'm going to talk about today was based on the commonalities that we have with your research concentrations. And so as we go through each slide, we'll have um, our, our thrust area with our, our sort of sub thrust is a, a heading. And then we have in the upper right hand corner, of each slide where we think we most naturally fit with your research concentrations. We go to the next slide. Detect and protect. So I do not expect you to, to read everything on this slide. I just wanted to give you an example of what we have in our detect and protect portfolio. So each of the, the blue bubble squares in this case is the program name that we have in, in this thrust area with a sort of a little pithy description of what it is. Today, I'm going to focus on things like detection, medical countermeasures, and manufacture of medical countermeasures by highlighting just a few programs in this thrust area. So next. So threat detection. 
have you ever, the day before you're starting to come down with a cold, you, you feel a little off? Um, you know, if you were to you know, test yourself, you, you might not have a cold, but there's something that's not quite right and your body knows. So what we're doing in, in ECHO, epigenetic characterization and observation, is, is looking for those signals. So we're looking for epigenetic changes that occur on or to the DNA that, that uniquely describe an exposure. So that exposure could be to an infectious disease, it could be to a, a chemical or a, a pollutant. And so what we've shown is that sort of these tags, so like these kind of like sticky notes on, uh, you know, on your DNA that say, hey, I've, I've been needed before, like you might want to come back to me. Um, those sticky notes and epigenetic changes get put on the DNA in, in unique and repeatable ways, depending on what you've been exposed to. So we've shown this for differentiating different bacterial infections, even antibiotic resistant from antibiotic susceptible uh, MRSA, right, SAP. Um, we've done it for a number of viruses and we've done it for pesticides. So I think one of the big wins that's come out of this is that we were able to also look at the, the ECHO technology for uh, development of a, a signature for COVID. And so we're able to not just say, yes, this person has been exposed to COVID, but there is even an indication that you can gain prognos prognostic information. So is the person going to have a mild case or a severe case? And I think that's very exciting. The next slide talks about some of our medical countermeasures. So we have a, a program focused on developing bodies that can be used to prevent uh, an outbreak of a disease or to treat specific diseases. Um, P3, the Pandemic Prevention Platform, has been a program, has been in uh, under development for about four years. So there was about two years into the program, say, I'm going to be able to rapidly identify and manufacture antibodies to whatever disease you hand me in 60 days, right? So that's an audacious, in 60 days, right? Crazy audacious goal. Two years into that effort, um, along comes SARS-CoV-2. And the program manager says, okay, I know that we were about to have a, a pressure test and check how the systems are doing, and we are gonna test it against flu. Super important. But let's pivot and do a test against SARS-CoV-2. And what the performers were able to do was within 90 days, identify and manufacture antibodies that were in phase one clinical trials in someone's arm in 90 days, halfway through the program. It was astonishing. Now, some of the antibodies that have been developed out of this program are the only ones that are in use now that work against the Omicron variant. So we're, we're pretty excited about that program and the impact that that platform technologies like that can have. We're also interested in developing novel medical countermeasures that can outcompete viruses that rapidly mutate, like SARS-CoV-2 or the flu. And then down on the right, we're interested in addressing the, the, the problem of antibiotic resistance. And so we're not trying to do this by developing new antibodies. We're trying to do that by leveraging systems the body already has for getting rid of things that are, are not good for us. And so we're creating these chimeric proteins under, under here to, to target a pathogen and drag it to a part of the cell that's going to get rid of it and then, then displace it. Next. We also think about how do we make these medical countermeasures? So if we can create these great medical countermeasures, but we can't do it at scale or in a way that can provide them to the community that needs them, we still have a problem. So Jeff Ling, who's going to be the, the next speaker, started a program back when he was at, at DARPA called Battlefield Medicine. And he wanted to be able to produce things like biologics on demand on location. And so there have been some great wins out of that, including developing yeast-based systems that can create small biologics. 
We also have two other efforts called Nucleic Acids on Demand Worldwide, or NOW, and Revolutionizing Protein Manufacturing. Now is the goal of now is to create a, a, a large box that can sit on the back of a truck. So a six by six by six box that can be moved wherever the DOD needs it. And inside this box, you can make nucleic acid-based medical countermeasures. In one side goes the sequence that you need of you know, say your, your RNA vaccine. Out the other end comes GMP quality. RNA that can go right into someone's arm. Next slide. Moving on to, to warfighter readiness. Here, I wanna talk about just a, a, a few of the programs that, that get to the theme of warfighter readiness, as well as operating in austere environments and um, some of the, the, the neurotech restoration work that we have going on. The next. Right. Readiness is a, a, a huge deal as well as is fatigue. So we have a new program that is just starting. It's called Fatigue Assessment via Breath or FAB for short. Because um, if it works, it will be FAB. Oh, sorry. Oh, bad, bad joke. I'm not allowed to do dad jokes in public. Um, I shouldn't be allowed to. Anyway. The fatigue assessment via breath is, is trying to understand how do the volatiles in our breath relate to our fatigue state. And if we can understand that, it can give us a lot of information about readiness and interventions that may be needed. SNAP, which stands for Smart Non-Invasive Assays of Physiology, is, is aimed at understanding the, the physiological readiness of an individual to provide that individual with information that they can use. So the way we're thinking about this is, you know, let's say I'm, I'm, I'm a runner and normally I can run a mile in, I'll be generous and say nine minutes. And I need to go do it today. Well, am I ready? Am I going to be able to do my, my, my nine minute mile or am I not? There, we're trying to move away from things like wearables, which are, you know, add a lot of information and context to us to biomarkers that are present in things like our saliva to give us answers to that question. Am I ready to go for my run and do a great job right now? Next. So we're, we're very interested in novel interventions within this sub with this thrust area of our portfolio. And Panacea is another platform technology. And here what we wanted to do was say, the drug discovery process is hard. Are there new platform approaches to developing novel drugs? And we chose two relevant DOD relevant use cases of pain and hypoxia. So can we create a platform technology that will allow us to reliably generate drugs that will actually be useful for these use cases? And we're doing a great job with that. What I've highlighted on the picture here is again, during the, the initial days of the, the COVID pandemic, we said, hey, this is a platform technology. If we can identify drugs for pain and hypoxia, could we identify drugs that could be used for SARS-CoV-2? And what the performers did is they, they did, they, they applied their platform and they created what we call an interactome, a, a set of, of maps that define how the SARS-CoV-2 virus interacts with the human cell and then screened against that to find protein, sorry, to find drugs that would interrupt that interaction. And so what they found was a number of drugs that they thought were very useful, and two of those are now in clinical trials. Biostasis is all about that, that, that golden hour. The, our tagline here is slow life to save life. And here we're inspired by biological organisms like the tardigrade, which can be you know, frozen for you know, extended periods of time and then spring back to life. So in that golden hour, how do we slow the warfighters cellular metabolism to give a little more time to get them to an area where care can be given? We're having good success here and um, 
I'll, I'll, if I have time at the end, I'll, I'll highlight an example that's coming up. Next slide. Traumatic brain injury. I think this is something that, that we all care about and is, is difficult to, um, can be difficult to prevent and difficult to, to treat. A lot of times uh, an individual doesn't even know that they've experienced a, a traumatic brain injury until hours, days, possibly weeks after. And so a lot of the treatment comes hours, days, weeks later. And so we said, what if we could understand what happens right away in that moment of injury inside the cells, right? Inside, you know, what, what molecular biology occurs in that moment? Because what happens is it leads to this cascade or domino effect. And so there are lots and lots of things that you have to be able to, to treat. So in theory, so hypothetically, if we could understand that first domino, could we find a way to prevent the brain injury from happening? And that's the goal that we have in Cornerstone. Next. Moving to working in austere environments. So F-Sharp is a, a program to create an artificial whole blood substitute. So right now, the, the, the warfighter and the medics need to have a supply of, of whole blood. And should, should they need to have access to blood? What if they could have a, a dehydrated, shelf-stable, artificial whole blood substitute? So that's the question that we're asking here. We're trying to, to develop that with our, our performers so that it will be available for, for the warfighter use. Um, Pocus AI, so point of care ultrasound. Uh, here, we're, yeah, we want to be able to provide medics with the capability to use this point of care tool. Right now, interpreting these images is hard. It's, it's a challenge. And so we challenge the performers on this effort to, be, to create new AI-based algorithms to be able to accurately guide a medic in their interpretation of these images. We're doing this for things like collapsed lung, as well as um, you know, interventions that may need to occur, um, like um, you know, inserting a catheter or other use cases. So leveraging the ability of, of AI to create generalizable algorithms so the, the medic can then apply this technology to multiple different use cases. And finally, over on the right, um, better bioelectronics for, for tissue repair. Uh, you all know more closely than I do that the warfighter can sometimes incur ghastly wounds, you know, burn and blast wounds that require a, a lot of repair. We want to find a way to um, help that repair move along more quickly. And so in better, we're creating miniature sensors. So we've created a, a one millimeter cubed wireless sensor that can be inserted into a wound site and monitor that wound site for things like temperature, pH, and other, other wound healing attributes. Provide that information back to the, the user, the, the, the doctor, wirelessly, so that you can guide healing and speed it. Next slide. The, the, neurotech, the neurotechnology portfolio um, focused on, on, on restoration for the warfighter. So um, on the the left side of the, the slide, haptics, is the, the world's first sensorized prosthetic. So it's a, a prosthetic arm that you know, not only allows the, the, the wearer to, to grip, but actually feel what they're gripping. And on the, the other side of the slide, BG plus stands for bridging the gap plus. And so one of the things that um, the, the community knows about spinal cord injuries is that the, the nervous system above the injury and below the injury remain intact. And so the hypothesis here is, if, are we able to bridge that gap 
and restore function along the spinal cord. This program has been going for about a year and a half, and we've had um, really encouraging success in showing that we think we can bridge the gap. And what this will do is it'll allow restoration of function, potentially not just for movement, but for things like bladder and bowel control that affect daily living. Next slide. So operational biotechnology, um, and as, as I promised, I will be, be quick here um, for, for this audience, um, but we're, we're excited about how, how this space, how biology can really help solve a, a variety of problems. Um, so next. So the program called ReVector is, is aimed at leveraging the, the skin microbiome, right? So those, you know, the microbes that, that live with us. So one of the things that we know is that there are some people who mosquitoes love and some people who mosquitoes avoid. We want the warfighters in an environment where there are mosquitoes carrying diseases to be the people that mosquitoes avoid. How can we help that in a way that doesn't use, you know, deep or nets or, or other, other you know, physical or chemical barriers? So the idea here is to, to leverage the microbiome to either decrease the attractiveness of an individual to mosquitoes or have that microbiome produce a repellent that, that keeps the mosquitoes away. And so repellent, we're thinking things like, you know, natural things like citronellol. And so we may all be able to go around invisible to mosquitoes smelling like a lovely citronella candle um, if this works. So next, so um, ice, ice control for cold environments um, is a, a brand new effort. Um, we're actually currently um, still accepting proposals for this program, but it is based on the fact that the warfighter needs to potentially operate in cold environments. Um, frostbite is an issue. Things like icing of ships is an issue when, when they're working in this environment. We also know that organisms like penguins or even bacteria don't mind the cold. They're adapted to deal with those situations. And so what we're trying to figure out in ice is, is can some of those biological adapt adaptations of other organisms help us do things like prevent frostbite? Next slide. I mentioned earlier that we need to have stakeholder pull and we need to develop technologies that will, will make a difference. And so I'm, I'm highlighting here just a few transitions of programs that I've, I've talked about already. So under the, the haptics program, one of the things that has come out of this is, is this device that enables that, that feedback and that communication that allows the, the sensorized prosthetic to, to feel and tell the user what they felt. Under P3, the pandemic prevention platform, we're highlighting the, the antibodies that have come out of this developed by our performers and manufactured by, by Eli Lilly. And Unravel Biosciences is a, a new startup that has spun out of our biostasis effort, leveraging their drug discovery um, platform and uh, approaches. And then ECHO, that epigenetic characterization and observation, looking at the epigenetic signatures. Here we want to be able to bring the assays that have been developed under this program to the wider community and to that end where we're transitioning some of the, the COVID assays to uh, existing platforms that can, so that you know, those technologies will be able to be run and available for use. And so with that, um, that is all I have prepared today, but I'm happy to take any questions. I uh, thank you. Does the audience have questions? Yes. Great, thank you very much uh, for that uh, presentation. You know, um, 
innovating in um, the health sector has always been difficult. Um, uh, yet, uh, sort of uh, uh, the kinds of technologies that we might use in uh, medicine have been accelerating uh, for a lot of different reasons. And so I want to ask you a question about uh, the business model uh, at DARPA. Um, so, um, you know, fail fast, got it. Uh, but in terms of uh, setting priorities and project management, um, can you give us some insight on how you do that so it's uh, the most um, effective means of uh, uh, ensuring that you get innovations? Because Today's problems require eclectic groups to get together. You know, um, you know. I keep making this point about uh, um, uh, 30 years ago, you probably couldn't get an engineer and a biologist to talk because mm -hmm. they didn't have the same language. But now the cell is uh, the engineering platform uh, today. You've given examples of that. So um, I wonder if you can give us some thoughts on the business model of project management getting teams together, understanding, let's say you're past the step of identifying the problem that you want to address. Some thoughts on that, and then I have a follow-up. Okay, great. So I think that um, one of the most important steps is that problem identification. And a lot of times in those discussions, um, that multidisciplinary approach comes out. And I think that quite exactly, as you said, that is the solutions, the solutions that we try to adapt to. And if I think about um, better, for example, the, the biomedical regeneration efforts in the human feeling, there's engineering, there's computer science, there's a lot of biology, um, but not just biology, but medicine as well. And so we need to think about all the pieces that go into and I think that's where the, the Heilmeyer framework comes into play. That third question, what's different about your approach? And so thinking about all of those perspectives in terms of what could our approach be, what are the possibilities, is critical. Then what we do sort of process-wise is we create a, a broad vision of announcement that is a problem and our sort of technical areas that we think need to be addressed in order to solve the problem and lay out those problems and metrics. And then we look to the world and we say, hey, engineers, biologists, mathematicians, campus, like what do you all think about this? And how what unique innovative insights are you going to bring to help our business? But again, how do you assemble that team? So there may be expertise, let's say, uh, in a group in uh, Utah and another group that might be in, in England, or how do you um, assemble and keep those various uh, contributors on track to get to where you want? Yeah, absolutely. So we, um, so I, I use the word for our performers, right? So they're the people who are actually doing the work. And so they start out by forming a, a subgroup, right? You know, so maybe there's somebody from the UK and, and Utah who, are, who, who want to work together and they put together a proposal and they say, hey, this is how I think I can solve your problem. Um, and so that, you know, that group, um, we, we have a scientific review and um, various groups are, are selected. Then, as the program starts, we have those, those milestones, those regular check-ins to make sure that all the groups are, are still driving toward actually solving the problem. Um, with the, the fail fast model, if there is a, a group that isn't on track to help us solve the problem, we stop funding them and we invest that, those funds into someone who is going to help us create that innovation. Great. Uh I don't mean to monopolize, but if I have one more follow-up, and then I promise I'll, I'll stop talking. Um, so as you correctly identified, um, you know, uh, DARPA got its beginnings back um, in the space race. In 62, Kennedy uh, made the proclamation that uh, we should endeavor to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade and bring him back uh, safely as a challenge uh, to bring a lot of different fields together to um, a clearly identifiable end. 
Um, the question I have is um, DARPA, a Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, um, what is your mechanism for throwing the uh, innovation and science over the transom so that it becomes a usable project um, and may be uh, manuf manufactured or developed at scale? Um, your, your mandate clearly uh, is, you know, these novel ideas. Tell us about the process of getting it connected uh, with uh, mainstream or Excellent. technology Perfect. transfer. Yes, okay. I'm, I, thank you. I'm excited to talk about that. So, you know, as, as you say, our job is to sort of prove that concept, to prove it can be done. But that doesn't give you something that you can use. One of the things that DARPA has started in about two to three years ago is what we're calling an embedded entrepreneurship initiative. And so I, I, you know, I talk on this slide, you know, one of our, our former sets has created a startup. Um, I'm, a, I'm a scientist, so I feel like I can say this. Um, I could start a company and I have great science thoughts. I have no business sense, right? So my startup, I'm, going, I'm you know, probably gonna fail. Right? So what DARPA is doing is we're pairing our, our scientists and our technologists who have a product that could be commercialized with an entrepreneur. And so under this embedded entrepreneurship initiative, we're paying for an entrepreneur to sit with them in incidents and help them with things like business plans, commercialization plans, even understanding what a minimal viable product looks like. So, so that they can use the capital they need so that you can then buy that information. Oh, okay. I Thanks so much for your for your talk. And it is exciting to see what biology can do, especially in the context of recently with the, the uh, uh, Biotech and Biomanufacturing Act supported by, you know, with money from the CHIPS Act. So that's a big deal. Um, but as we sit here at a military medical school, so with sort of medical solutions and need of answers, I'm curious the role between BTO and the up-and-comer ARPA-H, right? So which goes where? Who does what? And how will the BTO focus change? Yeah. So um, I'm I'm actually really excited about ARPA H. I, I think that well, not only um, you know is is Renee of DARPA, Renee Regazin, the, the the nominee to be the the director of ARPA H. So I'm thrilled for her. Um, but I think that we're going to have a very good relationship with them. We've been talking with them. DARPA as a whole, as well as BTO, about sort of how to ARPA um, so that they can set up an ARPA technology. Um, but I think that we have fairly well defined names in terms of the, who can do what. But as you, you know, nicely pointed out, there is, there can be some overlap. There are things that we're developing for the Defense Department that have a wider and because we stop at, at open concept and drive toward the, the DOD use case, that was the opportunity for, um, for almost transition of other nascent research over potentially to our page to capitalize on it in one potential way of and I think there's room for everybody in the Thank you for walking all the way across. Um, sorry about that. My name is Sri. I'm a first year um, in the MD PhD program, and I've always been a fan of DARPA's Brain Initiative, and I've even listened to the podcast about it. Um, so I'm wondering, what would you say are the first steps I should be taking for more involvement or for, a, I guess, a better um, stance with funding even from this early career standpoint? Okay. 
I'm going to stall for time while I think I sing. That's a hard question. Um, so the first thing that springs to mind is um, in terms of ways to engage with DARPA, there's a, a, a new initiative called the, the DARPA Innovation Fellows Program, which is, is seeking scientists and, and medical practitioners um, who have recently completed their, their, their graduate degree. So sort of at that postdoc level to come to DARPA for a period of time and work with us on some of these hard problems. So I think that maybe not right now, but that may be you know, one way in, in the future to, to get involved. Um, I think that um, you know, teaming with your, your research advisor on, on areas of interest. Um, I also think that talking with us um, you know, I'm, I'm available to, to talk anytime and you know, tell you more about what we're doing um, and you know, help you think through things. Great, thank you. I'm off to class now. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that talk. Um, I was wondering though, um, you know, the brain is um, separated both physically and physiologically from the body. And in terms of some of the testing and the applications that you uh, presented on your slides, such as epigenetic profiling, um, how, how, do you, how do you intend to accomplish that, um, those kind of goals for the brain? So I think that's, that's a, a really good question. And I think that on the individual programs, one of the things that we try to do is make sure that we have the, the perspective of, that you know, we don't carry with ourselves. And so thinking about getting stakeholder interest and transition partners who help us develop test and evaluation and even verification and validation of the technology that we're developing that include that broad perspective is, is really critical. There's a saying that uh, the road to hell is paved with correlations. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. You mentioned about fail fast, which is fascinating because the go, no, no, go, go type approach to things is sometimes very hard to implement. There's people involved, there's been the time, there's a commitment, there's a, we can just go another six weeks, we'll get, where I'm going with this is to ask you, do you have a set of expectations up front with whoever is approaching or, or you know, performing any particular project to say, this is your milestone. You don't make that or you do make it, and, then there's a decision. Is, it, is there something standardized or does it have to be customized to each project? Thank you. So absolutely, it is customized to, to each program. Um, we do have milestones and metrics at, at, at stages throughout the entire program. Um, some of our programs have defined go, no goes where we actually need to prove to DARPA leadership that it's worth continuing. Um, some of those are, are dealt with at the program level, but some are dealt at the, the full DARPA level. And so the, the performers are held to a, a high standard, um, but all of that is worked out in advance to make sure that they understand what they've, they've signed up for. Are there any, I'll say, pro projects that stopped that come to mind? There are always projects that stop. Um, uh, none recently, I don't have a there, but I think that there are, you know, there are examples of you know, if a particular approach isn't working, we don't have that anymore. Yeah, there's a, an interesting publication on negative results, which, you know, you can't attach a lot of validity to it, but it is an interesting perspective on what you do with something that that stops. Um, my other question, because we have some time, given that Dr. Ling, I think, is trying to find a parking space. But that said, um, when you talk about the various events that shape some of these projects, COVID being the most obvious, 
The world environment right now is facing potential issues with nuclear threats. I mean, they've always been there, but we have saber rattling by uh, Putin and so on. What does DARPA do with that event in order to either respond or perhaps it goes elsewhere? But is there a is there some sort of surveillance on that type of thing to say we need to start looking in this area? So I think that's um, that's a great question as well. I think that you know we're we're always thinking about what do we need to be doing you know, in particular in BTO in the the biology space to to try and prevent that that strategic surprise. And our program managers have the opportunity to define new programs as new challenges. Dr. Dugan, again, many thanks. I would like to ask Dr. Woodson to come up. Well, thank you so much uh, for coming and giving this fantastic lecture. I think here at uh, USU, we consider DARPA one of our strategic partners. We're in the defense uh, realm. And, uh, we're always looking for uh, new technologies and innovations to make sure that uh, we can defend this nation, the warfighter, and our citizens. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for what you do, um, and we look forward to future interactions. We just want to give you this uh, small token of uh, our appreciation for the lecture. It is our 50th anniversary, and that's our 50th, 50th anniversary uh, celebration coin. So let's give her a round of applause again for three years. Thank you so much. All right, it's my pleasure again to introduce our second speaker. Uh, Dr. Jeff Ling, uh, many of you know, uh, 21 years in the Army Medical uh, Department uh, brings him in contact with many. Uh, it's a distinguished career, which took him on many deployments uh, overseas in harm's way. And in part, that is a motivation for what he will speak about today, which is his on-demand pharmaceuticals program. Uh, he is the founder and CEO of that as well. A little background, he also is an alumnus of DARPA, in fact, of the same BTO as the one that Dr. Dugan uh, spoke about as far as the projects they're involved with. Uh, he also has served as the Assistant Director of Science in President Obama's White House Office of Science and Technology. He's a professor of neurology and an attending neurocritical care physician at Johns Hopkins Medical Institutions and here at USU. Uh, he earned his PhD in pharmacology at Cornell and also his MD at Georgetown University. Without further ado, Dr. Ling. Very nice. So it's good to be here back at the a place I felt like uh, gave birth to me sometimes, you know, and so uh, I felt like I was in the army so long that uh, if I died and uh, came back, I'd have to still serve a few more years against my HPSB scholarship. But again, it, it is it is really fun to be back at USIS. And so when Sharon asked me to come and speak, I was really quite honored. Uh, you know, as you know, I have really my career really launched at this really eminent university. And I just, I'm so proud of having been part of it. and still part of it. I'm an emeritus professor, which basically, as I recall, when we were young, it meant that you really got old. So I don't feel as old, but maybe I am. So it is what it is, right? So, but I'm, I, I still wear the moniker of being uh, still affiliated with USIS uh, with great pride. And it's good to see a lot of my friends here. And I can't be that old because I see young friends like Regina, Regina uh, Armstrong over here. And she's, she's only like in her thirties. So, I mean, like uh, doggone, all right? None of us age, none of us age, <laughs> none of us age. So, um, I'm going to, uh, uh, what Sharon asked me to do is to talk about, you know, how we came to some of the things that I was doing, because it's a little uh, non-traditional uh, compared to most of the science that we do here at USIS and also at some of the other places that I've been. Uh, so I like to coin it, the, uh, the talk is just say yes. And what does that mean? And this is something that I know you teach your students. And that is, is when you try to find a solution or a hypothesis to, for a problem at hand, you want to find the ways to say yes, because it's so easy to say no. When you say no, 
It takes away the obligation to do something. But if you say yes, that's where the hard work begins. And we all know this, right? Just go to the DMV. Getting them to stamp your, your registration uh, early is uh, the easiest answer is no, because then they're going to go home and go to sleep. But that's not what we do because of the nature of what we do. So always try to find a way and say yes. That's why I try to teach the young trainees the same thing. Look, if it's a great idea, if it's a great idea, learn how to find a way to say yes. And I'll give you an example from my days at DARPA. There was a program manager who came with this concept that he wanted to invent a invisible fighter jet. Now, normally you would laugh him out of the room. But at DARPA and at places like this, you say, wait a minute, wait a minute. If it works, if, if you really could make an invisible airplane, a jet fighter, that would be cool. We all agree that would be cool. So at least let's hear the person out. I mean, if they're a fool, they're a fool. But if they're a good scientist, they may have a pathway to get to this. Might not be enough tomorrow, might take 20 years. But if it's reasonable and rational and it's cool, why not do it? Let's say yes. And so that program manager actually was talking about not an invisible airplane to the naked eye, because that has no value, really. By the time you see a jet fighter in the field, they're already dropping you know, fire and steel on top of your head. What you want them to be is invisible on radar. And that he was talking about stealth. And that was a very defining moment for me because I understood, oh, what are you really trying to achieve? What has the highest value in your work? And so I always say to folks, first things first, come up with an idea that you think is cool and then find a way to say yes. So I've been busy since I left USIS, a lot of stuff. Um, but you know, I started in a traditional way. I, I, wanna, I wanna be clear here. I didn't start as an engineer and then go into the military. I started like all of you all. I mean, I went and got my PhD in pharmacology. I did benchtop work. I did a postdoc before I went to med school. And I did all those things and it was actually quite good. I mean, I, I published 17 peer reviewed journals including a first authorship in science during those uh, four years of grad school and three years of postdoc. So it was a pretty decent track record, you know, back in the day, all right, back in the day. So, um, but then the, I, the, I was missing something. I felt I was missing something. And what I was missing was the mission. And so I went to med school, I came here and I really found this place was amazing. I just love this place. I think this place is so special. You not only use the federal medical school and the trainees are the future physicians of our service members and the scientists that are devoted to the science relevant to our service members, it's just a great place to be. You have mentors who truly care. This is not true everywhere you go. I mean, we get a little jaded, but and those of us who have been here for a long time haven't had the privilege of going to other places and see how it really is. But here you have mentors who really care. They care about each other. They care about junior faculty. They care about the students. This is not a little thing. This is not a little thing. It is actually a little bit rare. So I applaud the faculty here, President Wilson, uh, uh, because they are still true to what being a professor is. Students, the students we have here are motivated, both the graduate students and the uh, medical students. They're highly motivated. This is great. This is great. And when you go on rounds at even a place like Hopkins, you see how many of them are talking about quality of life, when do I get off? I mean, it's not like in the old, good old, the bad old days when even as a third year medical student, you're doing every third night call. The students here don't complain. They really don't. They really don't. Furthermore, and this is relevant to the junior faculty, there is no pressure to maximize clinical billing. That is a serious pain in the rear end when you go out on the outside. That is a serious pain in the rear end. The salary you get is guaranteed. Okay, it's not as much perhaps as something on the outside, but I bring you back to the previous thing that you're not being pressured to, to bill. Billing is a pain in the neck. And the last, the competitive overhead that they complain about here at USA is actually not that bad. It ain't that bad. When I was at DARPA, you wouldn't believe the overhead that some of these institutions charge. It would, it would totally boggle your mind. So here at USA, it's actually a good deal for DARPA. It's a good deal for NSF. It's a good deal for NIH to work with the folks here. So all of these things make it Awesome to be at USIS, but the best thing of all is the mission. It is an absolutely an unassailable mission. And the mission is the patients, the patients, the patients, the patients. That's all that matters when you go to work doing what we do. It's the patients. And who are these patients? 
Oh, they're service members. Yes, they are. That's one of my patients when I was in Iraq. But they're also that patient when I was in Afghanistan, that little boy, missing his hand because of a Russian landmine. We go where we're needed. We do what we need to do. The young service members will bring that little boy to the combat support hospital, not because he's an injured service member, because he's a kid that got hurt. And there's no service member I know that would turn their back on such a child. They will call in an air evac, right? Back when you were general surgeon with the cash, same thing. They will call in an air evac for a little kid they don't even know to get taken care of by the docs and the nurses. And guess what? The docs and nurses will take care of that kid. So our patients are not just these, they're also those. In fact, when I was in Iraq in the bad old days, over 90% of our patients were not service members. And when I was in Afghanistan back then, over 90% of the patients were not service members. So it comes back to this. It is what are we trying to achieve with our academic work? It's an aspirational goal. Back when I was at DARPA, I would push people to say, what do you really want? You don't want a better stretcher. That doesn't help anything. What you want is the wounded service member to be able to gimp their way out so they're not tying up four other service members carrying them out. That's the way you have to think. You don't want a better wheelchair. What does a better wheelchair do? Bring grandma to their grandson's wedding smelling like day-old urine in the diaper? No. Grandma wants to walk into the wedding and dance with her grandson. That's the aspirational goal. That's the difference in how you have to think. So you don't be limited by what's probable or what's doable. Instead, what does it take to get what you really want? So when I was here at USIS, one of the things I wanted to do was I wanted to build a gadget. So I did other things, but this was really the thing that kind of floated my boat. I wanted to develop a gadget, a gadget that could diagnose traumatic brain injury, pneumothorax, and compartment syndrome, three really important combat calculus. And how can I get a machine or a widget that when I, when I point it at that patient, it will give me a diagnosis unambiguously, yes, no, because a yes, no answer will initiate a response sequence of some kind. We came up with this little widget. This, by the way, that box is, I, I, I poached it. It actually is the, it's a, what they call network analyzer for cell phone towers. That's what the cell phone guy carries on top of that tower to, to this. But what it does is it emits a radio frequency wave in the low gigahertz range from about 0.5 all the way up to about six. Why is that important? Because that level of electromagnetic radiation will actually penetrate skull, chest, bone, and the like. And what you're doing is you actually, and I poached this from the Air Force, is the uh, algorithm to um, decode those signals on the send and reflect were radar signals. It was actually used for radar. Because, and you say, why in heaven's name would you do such a thing? Because what does radar do? Radar actually sends an electromagnetic uh, frequency and looks at the reflection of it. Some of the, uh, the, uh, the radiation, the emitted radiation will pass through the object, the airplane, the cloud, whatever, and some of it will be reflected back. That boundary condition is called permittivity and permeability. So permeability is when the signal goes through, permittivity when it reflects back. When you actually balance the two, you can actually identify what the heck it is. So if you beam in the head, I can see where the, where the interfaces of dura, brain, CSF, and of course, in a injury, blood. Free blood should not be there. Pneumothorax, air should not be there. Air actually has a boundary condition. And of course, in a compartment syndrome, you change the boundary consistent because you have a deminous uh, tissue. So we, we succeeded, we did it, we did all that stuff, published a whole bunch of papers, and it was awesome. It was awesome. Uh, 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 the, Dean Hemming made me an associate professor because of it. I thank Dean Hemming for that. So um, the good was we came up with a widget. The bad news was I was in the army. I was in the army. to publish the papers, but how can we then move this forward in a commercial product? Couldn't do it, but I learned a lot. I learned about, you need to have an outside champion. You need to learn how to raise equity dollars. That's not a little thing. You need to pay attention to IP, particularly as it pertains to publishing. These are all critical things. And I learned this by doing, right? So coming back again is pivoted out, 
got sent to the war, came home, and I wanted to do something, and I wanted to do something with uses. And we did this, the prevent program, which is trying to find out if and what caused, in the primary blast exposure, caused injury. And then how do we use it for benefit? So we put together a team. Dennis Agustin, good friend of all of ours, of course, led it for here at uses. Uh, Dr. Uh, Parks and Dr. Bauman, who are at the rare, other friends of ours, uh, led the swine effort. And we had some other friends that we had to bring in from other places. They looked at ex true explosives under various scenarios. They looked at Marines who exposed themselves to blast. They looked at veterans. They looked at all these things. When they pulled it all together, they came up with a dose response, and this is relevant, of blast relative to brain injury. They also came up with some of the things that happened, what biomarkers are expressed, what are some of the magnetic resonance signatures of some of these injuries, particularly late stage, um, and as well as what were the cells that got injured, the astrocytes, the oligos, the pachinchies, the whole works, all right? And they showed how they were related to the science. That was wonderful. But you had to put it together. Publish your paper's great. Awesome. They make an associate professor for that. But does it help the soldier? No, you got to put it together. It's how you put it together. You turn that information into a gauge, something a soldier could wear. This is something that Jeff Rogers did at MCO at DARPA. Awesome. He made this, he got the guy to make this little itty bitty thing. You see the size of it. And you put it on your, on your web gear. And what it does is if you're exposed to a blast, it actually, this little thing in the middle, what's the, the blast wave signature. It tells you how much PSI that you were exposed to and shows you how long you're exposed to it. And that was great because it then, and then if they pushed it from that middle button, in this case, they did it with an M16 round, you could, it would light up green, hey, no pressure exposure. You're fine. You're good to go. Red, you're over 12 PSI, because we knew from the previous uh, slide, 12 is when you start to get some early changes, all right? So you want to be below 12, and that's what they did. And then yellow means that you got exposed to some blast, right? And you probably should sit it out. It got fielded. This got fielded. But this is what was really awesome about it. This is an example of an IED blast here. This is real data. Two soldiers. Wall, wall. Obviously, when you're out on dismounted patrol, you want to stay by a wall. Wall's a good thing. Maybe not. If you look at this blast wave, see it? Blast wave hits this soldier, okay? If you look at this one, he got a double hit. Why do you get a double hit? Watch. He gets the primary blast wave, but then he gets a reflected wave. And so when you look at the data, it shows that the one closest to the wall and further away from the blast is actually more injured. So why is this good? Because it led to practical outcome. It led to DSM 09.033, something I hope, right? Which is a mandatory screening following blast exposure, but more relevant, it changed oh, tactics. Number one. Oh. oh. No, that's right. I got it. So it leads to a change in tactics to reduce injury. Change in tactics. It is not a pill. It is not a surgical procedure. It is not an image. But that change in tactics has real relevance to the community we serve. And then when you're moving up on something that you think may be an IED, get the hell away from the damn wall. Real simple. Real simple. But it, that, that little bit of information saves lives. And I think that is an important contribution that we can make to our constituency. Another study that we did was this prosthetic arm and hand. As many of you are familiar with this, this is where you saw that little boy. That little boy was missing his right hand. Missing your right hand growing up in a world like Afghanistan is probably a life-ending situation. That is just not right. In today's day and age, why do we have that? So what we give our patients is the Utah hybrid arm, which you see over there. It's a hook. It's a hook. Hooks are very functional. You can hold a spoon with a hook. You can scratch your nose with a hook. But try to take care of personal hygiene with that hook. Mm. You're going to need a proctologist. So instead, what you want is you want a re what do patients want? Let's, let's look at it another way. Ask your patient what they want. Easy. They've seen it on the movies. I want an arm like Luke Skywalker got. Or they've seen the movies. I want to look like Del Spooner. Well, you know, I'd like to look like Del Spooner personally too, but you know, but, but 
they want to look like Del Spooner. They want an arm that looks like Del Spooner. That should be the aspirational goal, not a better hook. Not a better hook. So that's, in fact, what we did at DARPA. We went ahead and we said, let's go ahead and build the best robot arm that you can. Five fingers. It weighs eight pounds. Powered shoulder, powered elbow, modular. So if you lose part of the arm, you only need part of this thing. And how do you do that? You get the best engineers in the world you can find. And they're right here in the U.S. Right here in the U.S. Who is the engineers that we got to do this? We got two engineering teams. One led by DECA. Who's DECA, you would say? Who are these clowns? They invented the Segway. They invented the Segway. So they were one team. The other team was from the Applied Physics Lab. What did they do? Who are these knuckleheads? Uh, they sort of designed the cockpit of the space shuttle. So when you put those two clients together, they really can get it. But then you say to yourself, how do I want to control this thing? How do I control my arm now? I control my brain. I control my brain. So obviously you want to do some neuroengineering. That's an obvious thing. So you bring all of them together and you, and, you, and, you, and you fund them and you work with them and magic happens. And so we can click this as a slide. This is Andy Schwartz coming out of Andy Schwartz's lab. Is the video running? And this is a, um, this monkey has a chip planted in the brain and he is doing a reach out and grab. This was in 2005, all right? And Andy showed that in fact, by, you, by putting the electrodes in the motor cortex, Regina, you can do a reach and grasp task and they can, this animal can feed itself with its robot arm. This is what Regina teaches every fall to the students, all right? All right, next. How fast can you get to humans? At the end of the day, it's not about rats and pigs. It's about, and monkeys, it's about humans. So this is a film clip using the same approach in 2011. Go ahead and run that. And this is the first flight of this. This is Tim, who has an ECOG, so it's measuring EEG signals, using the same decode algorithms. And he's a, para, he's a quadriplegic. He's like Christopher Reeve. And this is him. And he's controlling that arm that you see on the post. And he's only asked, can you pick it up, down, left, or right? So the, the computer said, go up. And he then puts his hand up over the blue square. So of course, humans break the script all the time. So Dr. Lee said, let's do a high five. So he's able to do a high five. And of course, he's reaching out and to hold his girlfriend's hand. He's a quadriplegic. really untouching because it's not his hand. She called it his hand, but it's the way he's interacting with it that it becomes his hand. That's the, that's the important point. And so this was done in 2011. And you say, well, that's pretty cool. Um, but other people would say, well, you're kind of kludgy. You know, I mean, all you do is go up, down, left, right, who cares, right? It's kind of kludgy. And um, I would say, well, that may be, but this was actually the first time using brain machine interfacing that a human controlled a robot arm. It was the very first time. So again, it comes back to imagination. What can you imagine? If you were standing at the base of uh, uh, Kill Devil Hill in North Carolina in 1903, and these two knuckleheads from Dayton, Ohio, were gonna shove their flying machine off the cliff, and you're standing there watching this, and you say, all right, go for it, and they shove it off the cliff, and it flies for eight seconds. And some people would say, oh man, I got up, it's cold. This is all you do, it's loud, it's smelly, it only flew for eight seconds, sure, I'm gonna go and get something to eat. Or you're another person who has the vision, and you say, oh, oh man, they did it. They actually did it. They actually pulled it off. I'm gonna go start Southwest Airlines. I'm gonna start FedEx, you know? I mean, where does your imagination take you? And in fact, if you look, this was seven months later, not seven years, seven months later. And this comes out of 60 Minutes film clip, and the woman you're gonna see is Jan, who suffered from the, uh, spinal muscular atrophy, Regina, as SMA, so she too is a quadriplegic, but watch how she does with her arm.
And that's not cool. I mean, that, that really is, in my, my vision, is actually a major breakthrough. It is not a human controlling robot arm. It is a human controlling a robot just with their brain, which is way awesome, way awesome. So you say to yourself, that's cool. Have they moved on from that? They have. They've done closed loop now. They've actually put the signals back in. Christian Noy's group, John Donahue's group, Andy Schwartz's group, John uh, um, uh, 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 down at Caltech, uh, Rich Anderson's group, they are all now pushing the boundaries of this. They now want to put a second arm on a quadriplegic so they can self-transfer and on and it goes. This to me is really exciting, but it opens a door to a vast opportunity, a vast opportunity, because we, of course, are DOD. We do crazy stuff. So that lady, Jan, who was in the 60 Minutes piece, who ran that robot arm with her hand, well, if she can run a robot arm, maybe she could fly an airplane. So that's what we did. We hooked her up to a airplane. She never had a flying lesson in her life. And all she had to do was think about the control stick. And here you see her flying a single engine airplane. And she's doing so well that we sped it up and say fly through the Grand Canyon, which she did. In fact, this is all in one trip. In fact, she did so well doing this. We said, well, let's hook you up to the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter. So she's now flying the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter. And that's a very hard aircraft to fly, but no, she's diving, she's climbing. She actually has level flight. And she's doing it just by thinking about it. And that is what's really cool. It opens the opportunity of what we can do with these interfaces. And I think that that is a very exciting area for neuroscience as we move forward. The last thing I'm gonna talk about is something Sharon wanted me to talk about, which is pharmacy on demand. And this is a personal love of mine. All right. And it was really a kind of one would think a kind of a humdrum type of thing to do because I was trying to build a logistics capability. But in the end, I think that we can solve a major social problem. So when I was in um, Afghanistan in 03, um, the this is the hospital. Many of you might remember this person in the class of 91, Jim Eklund. He's a very good friend of mine, neurosurgeon. He and I deployed together with the 452nd Combat Support Hospital. And this was the hospital that we worked out of. It was a tent hospital. It was fine. That's where that little boy came into. We did a lot of good stuff. Um, but we had a very limited pharmacy. If you think about the pharmacies in a typical civilian hospital, such as a wall three, it looks something like on the left. The hospital pharmacy that we had was what that red arrow is pointing to. It's not pointing to the big box with the two big windows in it. That's the bathroom. And I'll tell you about that some other day over a beer but it's actually the little green thing that's kind of next to it. That was the extent of the pharmacy. So when I was there, I actually uh, uh, encountered a patient, a young, a young American who was injured in a gunfight down in um, uh, uh, protecting, oddly enough, the Afghan president at the time, Karzai. And he got hurt and he got sent to the combat support hospital and he developed a condition called dysautonomia. And that's where your blood pressure, your heart rate are running wild and all that. And it was very hard to manage him. And I knew I could not put him on an air vac back to Longstool because that's a 22 hour flight. So with his dysautonomia, I had to stabilize it out. Now, if I was in the ICU at Wall Street, it's real simple. I just give him bromocryptine. Bromocryptine is an old drug developed by Lilly back in the 50s. I mean, it's an old, old drug. No bromocryptine, no bromocryptine. And so what I ended up doing was calling back and the Air Force, God bless the Air Force. They went and got a box of bromocryptine, probably from some pharmacy or drugstore in Munich, Germany, stuck it in the flight suit of a, of a jet jock who then flew it to me. So I had my bromocryptine. When you think about the cost of that box of bromocryptine, it'll blow your mind. The gasoline bill alone must have been $50 million. So this made no sense to me. As you had heard, I have a PhD in pharmacology and I did a lot of medicinal chemistry in it. And then when you look at bromo, it's not that complicated a structure. Yeah, it's got some carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, which is because it's an organic, which is about all the small molecule drugs we have, and even large molecules are organics, but it had a little bit of bromine in it, big freaking deal. If you actually take a look, if you, you know, had nothing much else to do because there's no TV, so, Sat there and you look through the pharmacopoeia and you realize that the vast majority of drugs that we administer to our patients are in fact organics. So by definition, they have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. 
That's it. If I had a carbon hydrogen oxygen source and a good chemistry set, I should be able to make my own bromocryptine. Granted, I might need a little bromide. In some cases, I was going to make an opioid, which is a piperidine. I need a little bit of nitrogen. If I'm going to make ciprofloxacin, which is a fluoroquinolone, I might need a little fluoride. But I don't need the whole periodic table. I just need carbon hydrogen and oxygen and a couple of other things. It's like baking. I need flour, butter, and eggs. And if you gave me a little sprinkles, I can make them prettier. So in theory, if I had a good chemistry set and you gave me a glass of water, a pencil for my carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and an egg for everything else, I can make anything. But of course, therein lies the fun science. How can you fact start with some common starting materials with the appropriate equipment and make the drugs you want to make? Because after all, you don't need everything in the periodic table. You just need some good starting materials. And so that was the genesis of the Pharmacy on Demand program. And so I, when I came home from the war, I started working with these three really genius people. We, you got to always find people smarter than you. I found Klaus Jensen, Alan Meyerson, because I needed a chemical engineers to make my, my machine. And they needed to work with a really good chemist, not some you know, flim flam chemist like me. I need a really good chemist, organic chemist. So I got Tim Jameson. Now, the beauty of these three guys were they're not really bums, you know what I mean? They were, Klaus and Alan were full professors and chair of the Department of Chemical Engineering at MIT. And Tim was the chair of chemistry at MIT. So I got these three friends, became friends, said, let's do this. And they said, let's do this. And in fact, they, they, we created this machine that you see right here. And this, I call Darth Vader. And Darth Vader because of the snorkel on top. But what Darth Vader can do is it can make 14 different active pharmaceutical ingredients, 14 different ones when we were done at MIT. Now, to this day, today, it'll make 22 different active pharmaceutical ingredients that represent different drug classes. That machine, coupled with this little baby, will make tablets. And in fact, we have made from beginning to end ciprofloxacin. The cipro is good enough that if I had a urinary tract infection, I could take that cipro. And it will make a number of other medicines. The other interesting thing is you would say, was well, how much can a little machine like that make? And it will make probably hundreds of grams of a particular drugs per day, hundreds of grams. And you say, well, that doesn't seem like much. But if you think about the CONOPS, this would go into a single hospital how much atropine do you need? It's a milligram per dose. You have a patient with symptomatic bradycardia, you get a milligram of atropine. A gram is a whole lot of atropine. How much Versed do I need? One to three milligrams of Versed well, so that you can put in a central line. How much Versed do you use on a day? So as you can see, the numbers actually fit that that little machine could easily fulfill the, uh, the needs of any given hospital. And look at the size of it, size length. And that snorkel is so that it would be able to use all the chemicals and not disperse chemical toxins into the air. The other thing about that thing is it runs on 110 electricity, which means it runs off of solar. Runs off of solar. So that little machine coupled with this can make, this machine will make 1,000 Cipro tablets a day. 1,000, not bad. We also thought about this, when COVID hit, you're going to see a big, huge supply chain squeeze. But if you actually think about what we're doing is we're chemists. That's all we are. We're chemists. So we actually make the starting precursors to make the APIs, active pharmaceutical ingredients, that then we turn into pills. We make it all. Does anybody else make it all? And the answer is no. And I'll tell you why in a minute. But what, but what I wanted to do was make a machine that I could drop off of my friends at the combat support hospital so that they needed atropine, they push a button, they make atropine. If they needed bromocryptine, they push it. And you get the picture. And that's what I wanted to do. But then when I came home, and now that I'm at Hopkins and I'm working, still doing clinical medicine, I actually pick up the service in three weeks, um, you find that there are drug shortages. And look how far back these drug shortages last. 20 some odd years. We're always short on drugs. Always. And you say, and how many? Between two and 300 drugs on the shortages. 
COVID, of course, was insane. We won't talk, you know, that, that took another thing on us. And you say, why are we short of drugs? Because we've abdicated manufacturing of drugs to overseas. It's as simple as that. And so you may find a single manufacturer of tetracycline, one that makes doxycycline. Doxycycline. Do you know that doxycycline today, if you go to the wholesale market for it, it's 10 times what it was when I was a resident. Now that's going backwards, isn't it? Valproate, which is an epilepsy medicine, is five times what it was when I was a resident. These are generics. How could that be? Very simple. Only one company in China makes doxycycline, just one. And how do they get the price up? It's easy. It's easy. Just don't make a lot of it. So, but if you could make your own drugs, these are generics, they're all patent. Guess what? Your shortage goes away and your price becomes under control. The supply chain is a serious problem today. 100%, 100% of our generic medicines are touched by an overseas manufacturer. China dominates. India comes in right behind them. 80% of the drugs we have today are made of two countries, two. What do we do in this country? We simply ship them in. We've got three large distributors, Amerisource, McKisson, and Cardinal. They bring the thing up. They don't make anything. They bring it in. They put their markup on it, but this is what it is. Now, when President Trump said, enough, we're not going to stand for that. We're going to make our own drugs. Remember that? He said that. Well, good luck, because guess what? If you want to make Cipro, where do you start in the synthetic pathway to make Cipro? You have to source your starting material. We don't refine chemicals in the United States anymore. In 1990, Dow and DuPont held 80% of the market of refined chemicals. Today, it's zero. There's not a single chemical refining plant in the United States today, not one. They're all there. So if you want paint, if you want adhesive, you want medicines, guess where you got to go for your starting materials. But our little machine is a chemistry set. It's a chemistry set. So we actually start with either US or close allied source starting materials. What do I mean by that? We have a very robust petroleum industry. You can get aromatics from the, from the petroleum, benzene, toluene, and the like. You can get that from this. What about other things like um, you know, um, the nitrites and some of the other things? The ag industry. We have a great ag industry. You have to go pretty far back, but if you know your chemistry, and you work with your chemistry to improve your yields and all that kind of good stuff, you can actually start with US, Canadian, or Mexican sourced raw materials and move them through the refined chemical pathway. So pod solves that. Make the ingredients yourself. What about quality? What about quality? Think about that for a minute. If they're making it overseas, guess who has no jurisdiction? None. And it's called the FDA. This is a great book written by Catherine Eben. If you really want something to terrify you, take a re read of Catherine Eben's book. She, by the way, is a New York Times reporter, and it's called Bottle of Lies. And it talks about how the overseas manufacturers dodge every possible FDA oversight, and they ship it over here. But if you make it yourself, you, you solve that problem. So what does our machine do? Flexibility, resilience, quality, cheaper, greener, made in America, no shortages. Other than that, it's not bad. But who am I? I'm an old, short, fat, ugly, retired army colonel. In fact, I was so ugly, they kicked me out of the army. So what do I know about this? I don't. So what I did was I got a whole bunch of friends to help me. And so what we did was you saw the machines. We spun the, uh, the, uh, the uh, IP out of MIT, and now we're continuing to develop it out but you have to develop in the commercial world. So at some point, it has to leave the universities and go into the commercial world. So I licensed the primary IP out of MIT. We built up the America-made precursor modules. Those actually were invented by us. So we have the IP on that. We've created a big IP portfolio. We have about 65 patents right now, building more. We've, I hired a bunch of people. So I've got 80 plus employees right now, including Pam, who's up here helping me out. Um, 
And in this, we have a 45,000 square foot facility in Rockville, Maryland. And what we do is we're the only company that makes precursors, APIs, and patient-ready medicines. But this is not one of those things where I need an EUA. That's like, I think, shortchanging it. If you really want to make medicines and really want to do the quality thing, you got to go for full FDA approval. So to that end, we already have submitted our first two abbreviated new drug application to ANDAs to the FDA for review. So we're going the right way. We now have a health system client. I actually have about 12 under um, letters of uh, intent, but I have one who's under contract right now. And that is, and you guys will like this because it fits the mission that we all have, it is a health system in the southeastern part of the United States. There are six hospitals, 52 clinics, and they're 90% Medicaid. They're indigent. And um, this health system wants our platform, and we're going to get there within the next two years. We're going to deploy that first platform there. Why? Because during COVID, when there was a short supply of these medicines I'm talking about, like Versed, Propofol, we've made both of those, by the way, atropine, stupid things, right? I mean, these are, should not be short. You can't run an OR and ICU without Versed and Propofol. You just can't. It's not, not possible. So they needed these drugs. But guess what? They were in short supply. So what did McKisson and these other guys do? They auctioned it off. But a hospital system that takes care of primarily indigent patients could not effectively compete that way. So guess what they had to do? They had to use second tier drugs. They had to use, re remarkably, they had to use things like um, uh, bar barbiturates for sedatives. Who uses that anymore, right? They had to use morphine instead of fentanyl. I mean, that's ridiculous. That's what they had to be reduced to. And that really ticked them off. And in fact, when I talked to their CEO, who's a great guy, he goes, you know, I grew up in this town. I went to high school with these people. I go to church with these people. He said, and then now, because they're poor, they're considered second-class citizens in our country. And when I could not buy the drugs they needed, I was giving them second-class care. And that really made him mad. So he wants our machine so that he never faces that again so that he can provide first-class care to real Americans. And I love that story. So that's why we're pushing hard to get there. The other thing about them is you say, how did I learn about these guys? And this is the beauty of it all. Their CMO, Chief Medical Officer, he and I served in the Army together. So, and he, by the way, Jeremy Blanchard trained at Walter Reed and did his research here at USIS. So Jeremy knew about us because we're old friends. And he said, brought me down there and showed me what it was. And I learned something really valuable when you go down to a place like that. I say, there's a lot of poor indigent African-Americans, but there's a lot of poor indigent Native Americans and there's a lot of poor indigent Caucasians. And they, what they said was, Jeff, the only, there's only one race down here. And I said, really? He said, yeah, it's called being poor. When you're poor, it don't matter. Poor is poor. And it was just so touching to me that this was the place that we had to go. This is where we've got to go do our thing. Because at the end of the day, people can talk about inequity. They can talk about disenfranchisement. But if you have a chance to do something about it, then do something about it. So that's great. My company, I'm happy to say, currently has a half a billion dollar valuation. So we're doing well, we're cranking along, but you can never do things alone. And our vision ultimately is to solve the problems everywhere, empower people. I like to think about the biblical story of you can teach a man to fish or you can give him a fish. But I say, give him a fishing rod and teach him how to fish. So I just wanna say that in my mind, I am grateful for being launching my career at this wonderful place called USIS. So many other places could not allow you to do the crazy stuff that I did. USIS embraces it. That's the beauty of your USIS. I didn't have to worry about billing. I had great mentors, both in the military, in science, and clinically. I had a chance to work with some amazing students, some unusual students too, Regina. 
but I did have a chance to work with some really amazing students. And I got to, I got to serve my country in a very special time and place. It was a wonderful career, but it wouldn't have been such a career if I wasn't a US Army medical officer and I wasn't at this really remarkable place called USIS. So thank you. You're not off the hook yet. Questions from the audience, anyone? Well, Dr. Ling, I don't know if you remember me, Laura Broche, yeah, okay, yeah. It's like not remembering this all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but um, the, you know, going back to the DARPA glass gauge and uh, the uphill battle you guys had to get it into theater, and to see here at USU, the kind of work that's being done, maybe not with that particular blast gauge, but with our Invicta program, um, taking it to the next step. I mean, you guys were there and you started the ball rolling. So thank you very much. Anyone else? USU takes on the hard, the hard science when it comes to service members. You know, Laura, I, and you were also, I mean, very instrumental in helping us push all these things through because nobody else would do it. NIH certainly was gonna do it. I was on council then. I was on council of the NINDS and Story Landis stood up when I brought up the issue of TBI in uh, 2004 when I came home from the war. And she, her, she said to me, this is George Bush's problem. George Bush's war, this is George Bush's problem. She actually said that in open council. She said that. That's why I always will have a warm spot in my heart for Ralph Dacey. Ralph Dacey is the chair of neurosurgery at Washington University, St. Louis. And Ralph, I mean, I, I didn't know what to say when, 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 when I'm told this by the NIH intram, uh, in, intramural director, right? And, and um, Ralph stood to his feet. He was on council, walked straight and got right in her face and said, these are Americans. Furthermore, they're American taxpayers. They pay your salary. How dare you impugn them like this? How dare you? And I'll always remember, now, of course, Ralph Dace was a neurosurgeon. You know, they, they have no, you know, they have, they, 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 they have no frontal lobe. So it's great. They could easily do that. But, but, uh, I would, but that, that tells you what organized science thinks about some of the, the problems that we face. If we didn't exist to do this work, who would take care of these young people that we send into harm's way? Who? Look at how much money, you know this, because you led a lot of this, how much money is being funded for hemorrhagic shock, right? And, and, and Dr. Woodson, of course, is a general surgeon, you know all about this. But how would you measure up what you did when you were part of, you know, uh, um, MRMC, the amount of money you put in relative to what NILBI uh, puts in, right? And, and look at it as a percentage, too. It's flabbergasting. And tell me that trauma doesn't happen on our highways every day with significant hemorrhagic shock. So these are the kind of things that why they're, why they're, it's not so much that there should be an, an, uh, a uses, 
there must be a uses. There must be a uses. Well, once again, thank you very much. I have a question for you, um, and it's, um, uh, I won't say rhetorical, but it's meant to um, uh, sort of spark some uh, uh, thoughts in particularly our youngest uh, investigators and our, our young people. And that speaks to the issue of it takes courage to do this, right? Um, and it takes um, an ability to motivate uh, folks to work toward a common goal. Um, can you um, share with us some of your thoughts about forming teams uh, and uh, ma mo maintaining momentum uh, and the courage it takes to um, stick to it, uh, you know, deal with the agencies, deal with the bureaucracy, deal with the naysayers? Well, th I mean, thank you. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a big deal. Um, so first things first is whatever the idea you have, whoever the, whoever's ta I'm talking to right now in, in, out there, whatever idea you have, embrace it. It should be, again, what you aspire to. It shouldn't be a me too. It shouldn't be just an incremental change. It'd be something that's aspirational, whatever it may be. Say a blood substitute that's stable at room temperature. Could last for 10 years. That'd be awesome. So as an example, all right? If you have that as an example and you embrace it, you obviously have to first recognize that you can't do everything yourself. That's just, I mean, you know, days of, you know, Dr. Dale in his basement with his Bunsen burner and his dogs, you know, looking at blood pressure are, are long gone. I mean, a lot of the problems now require having levels of expertise. And the key thing is you don't know what you don't know. So you have to learn initially from your mentors on what kind of team you have to create. A lot of times you just don't know what you don't know. So always be open-minded, not only in terms of your science, but who you need to have working with you. All right, that's the second thing. The third one is you have to develop a story around where your science is going. It's going to have to have value more to than just yourself, but to others. It has to have value because that's the only way you're going to raise money. I'll be blunt. I don't care if it's grant money, philanthropic money, or equity money. It has to have value to somebody. The value that you probably hold to your heart is I'm going to save patients' lives. That's a good one. That's a great one. Don't give that one up. That's the one that you use for raising grant money. That's the one you use for raising philanthropic money. But at the end of the day, somebody's gonna have to make this thing and make some money on it. They're gonna have to make money on it. It's, it's, a, it's a sad truth. That's how you raise equity dollars. So you have to learn how to create a business model. I never had a business course in my life. So I had to go and learn it from somebody, right? Again, what do I don't know? But do it early. One of the things when I did my raft program, that little device was, I never thought about that, but I should have thought about that because if I did, I would have had somebody to help me hand it off to that then they could take it from me at a point that's relevant. I'm not going to carry this thing all the way through. I was going to quit the army and start a business making these boxes, but I need to have somebody who would. I could continue my science. I could, they could continue the construct of the, of the commercial enterprise. But as you, as the innovator, you, as the person who thought of this idea, contextualize it not only to save patients, but how am I saving lots of patients so it has tremendous value? Value is a really important word, very important word. And when you think about that value, commercial value is not a dirty word, it's a good word. Because it's very simple. It, put it in, this, in your own head. If I go to a restaurant and it's empty all the time, I love the food, but I go there and it's empty and I'm really happy because I get a table, that's not good. Because that person will go out of business and you ain't gonna be able to go there no more. You want to go there where there are people also thinking like you that it has value so that then you can go and eat at this wonderful restaurant all the time. I always go to these people when they say, oh, I'm sorry, it's busy, Dr. Ling. I said, no, I'm really happy because the busier you are, I know you're going to stay open and I get to come here. That's how you have to think. That's how you have to think. So the value proposition is really super important. And by the way, R&D dollars are good. They're wonderful. But it pales compared to what private equity dollars can bring in. And if you have a good grant, and you've launched your thing, it's never too early to start thinking about how can I bring in private equity dollars. Generally, a go one government dollar should raise you about 10 in the private equity market. So you got to think about that. And issues of IP and all that stuff, you can work that out. You can work that out. But really what you want, if you want your remarkable innovation to save lives, you're going to have to go through the entire process that we just talked about and start early. Well, thank you, Dr. Ling. Wow, what a treat. Thank you. Thank you.
And I'm oh, glad you're the president. I'm sorry. <laughs> Laura Pace. Hey, Laura. Good to see you. Thank you. So we have five minutes before the next speaker. Good afternoon. So now we're turning our attention to USU Innovation. Um, our first speaker is a has been funded by the DHP funded Transforming Technology for the Warfighter Program. This supports USU partnerships with other DOD biomedical labs, civilian universities and medical centers, and the NIH. Their goal is to advance and deliver new technologies to improve warfighter health and readiness. Research projects that primarily focus on combat casualty care, military operational medicine, and clinical and rehabilitative medicine um, are the areas of interest. These uh, 
projects for are selected for funding after undergoing rigorous scientific review and programmatic review with an emphasis on direct relevance to identified military needs. Our first speaker is Dr. Juanita Anders. Dr. Anders is a pre professor of anatomy, physiology, and genetics, and a professor of neuroscience at USU. She received her PhD in anatomy from the University of Maryland School of Medicine, and she is, was a postdoc fellow at the NIH in the Laboratory of Neuropathology and Neuroanatomical Sciences at NINDS, NINDS before joining USU in 1983. Wow. She is an internationally recognized expert in photobiomodulation research. So Dr. Anders, her presentation is on photobiomodulation for pain control. Thank you very much for the introduction. And I really want to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to talk about my passion for many years now, and that's a photonic medical treatment technique called photobiomodulation. Um, I'm well trained, so here are my disclosures. So, before I tell you what photobiomodulation is, I want to mention two things that it's not. But when someone meets me and I say I'm doing a photon therapy, the first thing they'll usually say is, oh, is that like seasonal affective disorder lights? Where you have a bank of lights you sit in uh, to avoid <clears throat> development of depression uh, in the winter. And often that's referred to as light therapy. That technique is light detected by your visual system, processed in the brain, having broad effects within the nervous system and other aspects of your body. Another thing that um, it isn't, photobiomodulation isn't, is photodynamic therapy. Now, photodynamic therapy, and the key difference here is exogenous chromophores. This is where you take a molecule that can absorb light made outside the body, inject it into the body. It'll localize, say, in a tumor. And then you apply light that is a primary, ab primarily absorbed by the chromophore you put in the body. And it destroys the massive cells by large production of ROS. What we'll see in the definition is we don't use exogenous chromophores, <clears throat> we use endogenous made by our own body. And what I'm going to talk about also is like going directly through your skin, through your scalp, to get to structures in the body that you want to target and have an effect. It's not a visual system pathway. There's two terms I just want to mention to you. Um, here, and one is optical radiation. So we all know we're talking here about electromagnetic spectrum. And you see that's divided, of course, into UV radiation, visible radiation, and infrared radiation. And I'm bringing this up so you realize that the predominant wavelengths used in phyto photobiomodulation therapy are in visible, mostly red, and in the IRA portion of the infrared. Doesn't seem to want to advance, thank you. Um, and another term is non-ionizing radiation. And non-ionizing radiation is electromagnetic irradiation that has enough energy to remove an atom, an electron from an atom or a molecule. And again, you can see in this slide that the visible portion and that UVA portion of the infrared are all non-ionizing. So let's look at the de definition, which took about 25 of us on a panel to come up with. Because one thing about this therapy and technique is that it's had all kinds of names, very imprecise, 
It had a bad reputation for a lot of reasons initially. And one of the things we wanted to do was come up with an accurate definition. So photobiomodulation is the mechanism by which non-ionizing optical radiation in the visible and, <clears throat> excuse me, near infrared spectral range is absorbed by endogenous chromophores. And that results in photophysical and photochemical events at the cell level, at the tissue level, at the system level. And photobiomodulation therapy then, it's photon therapy that can use any light source, LEDs, lasers, broadband, to emit the appropriate wavelengths and result in physiological changes and therapeutic benefits. Now, I just gave you a little beginning lecture <laughs> on photobiomodulation. And one of the reasons I wanted to do that was because recently a large amount of money has come to use this to look at medical application in the military especially for musculoskeletal function, for recovery after training, and for prevention or improvement of performance. And some people have called me up and asked me, and the problem is, and it's historical in this field, that people find out about this again, even though it's been out here for about 50 years, and they start to reinvent the wheel. And they do the same thing over. And I thought if some people in the community are listening to this, I, I have consulted with some of them, but I would be so happy to consult with anybody to continue to move this forward and not lose any more time. So I'd like to start with a bit of a story also, because this is the 50th anniversary and I haven't been there quite that long, but almost. Um, and I don't think a lot of people, we have so many new people, realize that USIS has been involved in phototherapy studies and medical treatment for a long time. So my very first study, I wanna tell you about this, was looking at nerve injury. And how this happened was I had come here and my time at NIH, I was an expert on astro astrocytes and glial formation and how I could change cells, communication, gap junctional communication of astrocytes when there were injured cells in, in present. And I had developed a culture system really nice. I used the laser, very, very small beam and I could individually injure neurons, actually neurites in a culture dish, and then cold culture them with glia in a sandwich culture. And what happened at that time was the development of the free electron laser and Ronald Reagan's Star Wars program. And a, a message went out to use this uh, investigators and said, oh, we're looking for medical applications for the free electron laser. Which, which I want to tell you was extraordinarily powerful and used to blow, uh, you know, essentially incoming missiles out of the sky. And, but they got us together and briefed us since there were going to be, I think it was five FEL sites and Uniform Services was competing. So they got money to set up a laser physics lab, beautiful laser physics lab we had here down in Vic. And, then they started to kind of train us about the FEL, that it would be, it's very powerful, but it would be put in the basement of a hospital. And they would use optical cables to carry this light to treatment rooms and operating rooms and to you know, dissipate the energy so you could do a therapy. Well, I went ahead and I applied to the program, but I applied for my astrocyte communication work. I got the grant. And it was taking a long time to get my equipment in. And because I was going to do fluorescent recovery after uh, photo bleaching to look at communication in these cells. So I started to read the literature and I came across this red light therapy stuff, low level light therapy. And I looked at some of the experiments and I thought, 
I could do a better job than this. And so I went to see Dr. Rosemary Bork. So some of you know very, very well. And she was working on uh, models of uh, nerve injury, specifically hypoglossal nerve and facial nerve. And I went to her and said, wouldn't you love to do a project with me? And we'll look at and see if this can increase, you know, what can it do to regenerating nerve? So she was game and we decided to do the, uh, the facial nerve. And our hypothesis was that we could improve nerve regeneration and functional outcome. And this was basically the study. So we did, first of all, a crush injury. But this was a picture of all the rats was down in the laser center here at USIS. And it had a, a lovely argon pump dye laser that we could split the beam and it was great because we could do multiple animal treatment and also monitor the dose, the output powers, the fluence during the whole treatment. And so we treated right over the nerve that was injured. And then we injected after a certain amount of time, classic old experiment, horseradish peroxidase into the face of the rat so that the facial nerve endings would take this up and transport it back to the cell body. We knew about the time it might take to transport it, when to inject it. After the given amount of time, we got the facial motor nucleus out of the medulla and we did a histochemical process where we could now visualize the HRP. And you can see that Possibly, you can see there's a few, like maybe five neurons in there that are all black. They become loaded with <clears throat> the HRP. And so this is basically what we found. We found that when we use the light therapy at this regimen and scheme, that we were able to increase the rate of nerve regeneration. And at that point, I was hooked <laughs> on this uh, uh, technique. So what we did then was at that time, anything you did pretty much in photobiomodulation therapy was really criticized. And so I got comments that, yeah, this was nice, but you did a crush injury. It's just not stringent enough. So we went ahead and did a transection injury. And for this study, we looked at calcitonin G-related peptide at, at the RNA level. And this is what Dr. Bork routinely looked at when she was working with her motor neurons, because this was a herald molecule. When you saw this upregulated, you knew that that motor neuron was going to go into regeneration phase. And what we found was that not only do we increase the rate of nerve regeneration, but we also increased the CGRP to higher levels. And the other thing we showed was we increased motor neuron survival. Now this slide is very deceptive. It looks like so easy, right? Um, it was a lot of work by a lot of medical students who volunteered in the lab, graduate students, because we cut all of the facial motor nucleus, kept it in a series and went through and counted to make sure we only had profiles that had nucleolus and put this together. But the really amazing thing is when you get peripheral nerve injury, you never get full recovery. And for facial nerve in our lab and in other labs, you got about 36% uh, of facial nerve motor death. And we were able to drop that to about 15% with this technique. Thank you. So I'm showing you this picture because one thing is gonna tell you is I was lucky because at that point, I really didn't know about light and wavelengths and depth of penetration. And I had used a red wavelength that everybody was using. 
but in the rat, the facial motor nerve is right under the dermis. So I got lucky, even though I get scatter of about 30% of the red light due to the skin, the dose was enough that I got an effect and continue to work. So how do I go from that rat model to the human? And any of you who've dissected the facial motor nerve, you know that the bulk of it is deep and embedded within the parotid gland. So we had to start thinking about ways to get light into the body. So the first law of photobiomodulation says that if you wanna have a, an effect on a living system, on a cell, that cell has to be able to absorb that wavelength of light, absorb that energy. And based on a lot of research, and there's a lot of publications, the light, the wavelengths of light, red up to about a thousand that are routinely used in this therapy are absorbed by cytochrome C oxidase within the inner mitochondrial membrane. And this leads to enhancement of mitochondrial activity, increased activity of cytochrome oxidase, increased oxygen consumption, and restoration of electrical uh, gradients and increased ATP production. Now you can imagine so many diseases and uh, injuries cause a downregulation of mitochondrial activity. So that's one of the things that allows us to be tested in a number of disease and injury systems. Now I don't wanna imply that this is the only chromophore within our body that's absorbing light. Blood absorbs light, water absorbs light, some receptors absorb light. Um, and we're finding some new receptors right now. But the bulk of the evidence for photobiomodulation is still pointing to cytochrome C oxidase. So basically what happens is you put light, usually 600 to 1,000 nanometers. There's two major peaks of absorption, one in the red and one in the near infrared or that IRA. And, and you cause a change uh, in gene transcription, changes in RNA and protein expression. You initiate cellular signaling and that uh, leads to essentially growth factor production, uh, metabolic alterations and anti-inflammatory effects and results in a new improved clinical outcome. Now I'm gonna go through um, a few more things that we help determine and set on what you need, the kind of parameters you need for effective PDM. And I will give you some of the examples of that. Next slide, please. So this is a study we did using normal human neuronal progenitor cells. And my lab came up with this technique we called it the grid method. And we could get a series of uh, radiances um, or power density at milliwatts per centimeter squared to apply light of that irradiance onto these cells in the tissue culture dish. We vary the time and that gives us affluence. Okay. And what we were doing was we were looking at total neurite extension per neurosphere here. And we were using a 10 nanometer light, which you'll see in a minute why I'm partial to that. Um, but what we found was that there wasn't just one optimal combination of time and irradiance that gave you the dose. We found that there was an island in all kinds of systems where you have some leeway. And that's important because people will always talk about this field and say your dose is either suboptimal optimal or inhibitory, you go too high. But you do have some leeway on combinations, well, which makes your life a little easier if you're developing a treatment. Oops, sorry. Okay, so we did this little experiment to grow normal human progenitor cells. 
and a lot of other type of stem cells. You start to grow them in one media, and then you put them in uh, another media, I'll call here factor media, and you give these factors that will cause them to start to go down a differentiation pathway. So we set up an experiment where we had factor media, we had controls with uh, just the beginning media, and then we used the photobiomodulation therapy and treated the cells with light. And what we found, this is double quartan stage. Uh, we looked at processing. And what we found was we got the same exact result with the factors and the light treatment. And then we looked at some uh, expression of different growth factors. And we found that the light upregulated the production of these growth factors. And you could see these are also the factors are, are looked at here. And so the light produced um, equal to or above the levels of factors that were added to the dish. And it also uh, produced nerve growth factor, which wasn't one added in the dish. Um, so this led to some intellectual property about using light to in lieu of factors uh, in growing uh, cells or differentiating cells. So one of the most important characteristics that you want to think about if you're gonna do photobiomodulation therapy is the wavelength. And your goal is to choose a wavelength that, especially if you wanna work on a deep structure like I do, to choose the wavelength that has least absorption by water, melanin, blood, so you can get it into the depth of your body. And so what we did was move on to this next study and what I'm gonna tell you is part of this study. So at that time, uh, we were looking at this, Dr. Burns at our university came to me, she was a student and said, she wants to do spinal cord and light. And I was very hesitant at first because it wasn't easy to get funding except from the military. They've been always very good. Um, and I just thought she might have a hard time because this was viewed as so fringe. But she was insistent and I'm glad she was. And uh, besides her, uh, the gentleman here on the left-hand side, um, Dr. Ronald Wayden was the chief optical engineer at the FDA. And the FDA was suddenly getting all these applications for passing devices. And at that time, they didn't have a 510K application that you could liken to a heat device, which hasn't done this field a lot of favors in some ways. But anyway, he came to me and he wanted to join forces with a biologist we wanted to start looking at some things to get evidence when they were looking at the applications. And in the center panel is Dr. Uh, Ilko Illa, the one who's sort of pointing, he was his postdoc and there, all of them were a fiber optics. And this is the lab up at FDA where I've spent many a happy hour. And Ilko is now the chief biomedical science officer uh, for optical applications, and we still work closely together. So we didn't take the animals there, but they developed optical fiber systems, light delivery systems, and they came to our lab. And you can see in that first panel, that's an anesthetized uh, rat. And my lab was one of the first to actually measure light penetration into an anesthetized living animal. Uh, up to then, most people were doing mathematical modeling, like Monte Carlo modeling, or they were doing phantoms where they would build a phantom with different layers and then look at light passing through. But we did this and the sort of gold colored tube is actually delivering white light to the back of the rat. And then we have a fiber optic that we inserted via a needle and we could get to different levels within the animal below the skin, muscle, spinal cord, uh, bone. 
and we could get the profiles of these various wavelengths from 500 to 1,200 nanometers. And what happened was we found a window between approximately 790 to 820 that had the greatest depth of penetration. And the peak of that was at 810. And that's what we continued to use in our study. And as of now, on most of the new techniques, especially transcranial stimulation, most people are using 808, 810 uh, because of the depth of penetration. Uh, the beautiful thing about this wavelength is that it also, notice how similar the profiles are. It has really high transmission through blood. And we did these measurements in, through the heart and optical fibers in a, a living rodent. And notice down here that there's uh, the amount of energy detected in the uh, tissue with transmission that the brain and spinal cord are quite low. But when you think about muscle, brain, and spinal cord, and if you think about absorption in mitochondria, these are the tissues that have the highest mitochondrial uh, presence also. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we also looked at water and we found that there was minimal absorption by water. So it was a beautiful wavelength, minimal absorption by blood, minimal absorption by water. And Kim, uh, Dr. Burns went ahead and uh, did her study. We used the 810. Uh, we used a device that the FDA colleagues modified from a commercial device to do what we wanted. And she found a number of things. I can't, don't have the time to go in detail, but she suppressed cell invasion and pro-inflammatory cytokine and chemokine expression. She significantly increased the number of axons uh, passing through the lesion site, the distance they regrew. And in re innervation back to, down to the L3 level, which we determined by functional measurements and also by anterior and retrograde transport of fluorescent molecules. Um, so these the data provided a basis for looking at PBMT for improved axonal regeneration. And I just actually um, reviewed a study that's being done abroad for use of PBMT in cord. But interestingly, it was with an embedded fiber because it's very difficult to get the amount of energy you need down to the cord. Um, then uh, in association with that study, my chairman at the time, Dr. Pollard came to see me and he said, you know, I talked to my, am I okay? <laughs> I thought I shut it off. <laughs> He said, you know, I talked to my colleagues and they always ask me, why are you letting her work on that stuff? <laughs> and he said, they're very skeptical. So he wanted tissue from injured, injured, light treated, and of course control. And so we gave him that and he went ahead and analyzed it in his laboratory we looked at like a thousand genes. Um, they did a, a better analysis on the top 200 genes. And we found out that for some genes, we had a decrease in expression. And those were like inflammatory response. There was increases in like neural traffic, uh, neurotrophic factor receptors, decreasing in cell proliferation. And remember Kim showed she could stop migration and of astrocytes, other glia, fibroblasts into the, uh, that scar area to form a scar. So Dr. Pollard said he believed it now because of this data, which was good news for me. And we then, uh, the other point I really wanna make here is that in the beginning, and people still do this, they think about this therapy as stimulation, increasing growth increasing proliferation. But the thing we know now is you can put light on a system, on a tissue, and depending on the state that tissue is in, is it an injury? Then the light will come in, it will increase some things, decrease expression of other genes and not affect any, which is how a system would work. 
And it's almost, if you think about it, like putting energy into an injured or sick system and it starts to give energy into that cell and change expression to bring it back to normalization, maybe faster than it uh, normally would. So another really important uh, point I wanna make and, and people uh, have some misconceptions about this is wavelengths are important and not only for depth of the, the, you know, what I showed you all that depth, but wavelength determines the depth of light penetration, period. People always try to say, oh no, I could change it. I'll increase the power, I'll change it. But that's not what you change. If you increase the output power of your device, you are increasing the number of photons. As you can see in this panel on the bottom, this is with a near infrared camera, you're changing that to more photons along that depth that was determined by the wavelength, okay? So that's another, when you're trying to figure out your dose, you decide on your wavelength and then you have to start to decide on time of treatment and also uh, the power density or radiance that you would use. So in this particular study, this was funded by uh, the army to look at nerve regeneration again. And this was in New Zealand white rabbits. And in this case, we um, are working with a company, my industrial partner, um, who is still the industrial partner on the T2W grant. And they built these special sensors where I could actually measure what the irradiance was, what the power density was at depth. And uh, the one you see there, that was a first generation. Now we have some beautifully small, tiny uh, sensors that are even more uh, sensitive than that first generation was. So we went ahead and we got an idea at different output powers, what the power densities would be at different levels in the body. And we came up uh, with a, this, these parameters, four watts at 15 seconds, two watts at 30 seconds uh, in an area. It was big because we were scanning it. And we did a uh, transection and coaptation of the peroneal nerve. So we sewed it back together. This was down uh, in uh, DLAR. Uh, which is a wonderful support system. If you work on anything bigger than a rat, uh, they had a technician there with you. It was it's just superb, really. And what we found was that this is for two weeks, at two weeks post that transection, and you could see the profiles of the axons themselves that we stained for. You see the injury site. And then we did labeling. We labeled the axons and we looked at two, two centimeters distal to the cut and then three centimeters and four. And you see at two centimeters, everybody's kind of growing out to that distance about the same. If you go to three, the four watts is inhibiting the outgrowth. And that was the same total amount of energy. That's why you can't just say, oh, I did. 60 joules. And at four centimeters out, it was even more pronounced that the nerves were not growing that fast. So we revisited, we adjusted our settings. I just want to say we did a whole bunch of in, vi uh, in vivo work, excuse me, in vitro work to decide those initial parameters. Um, so then we had the rabbits and we did a functional test. Uh, if you lift your cat or a rabbit and you lift it like this, it'll spread out its toes, okay? And then we videotaped it and measured it. So you can see the baseline values and then at nine weeks where it came back to. And also we looked at re of uh, the neuromuscular junction. So when you transect a nerve, the neuromuscular junction itself shrinks and if you get re as you can see, it will go back with re to its original size. Um, 
We stopped this project at nine weeks. I wanted to go to 16, but the Army wanted their data, so uh, I have nine week data. So conclusions for kind of what you have to think about when you're setting up your experiment is uh, for treating deep tissue, the most important parameters are wavelength, your output power, spot size, and the length you treat, the time. Wavelength determines depth of penetration, as I told you, and the output power will determine the dose, the number of photons you deliver at the tissue. Different tissues and cells do not respond the same. And one set of treatment parameters can't be used to treat different issues. And those two sound so simplistic, right? But generally a lab will get one laser device and they use it for everything. And most of the result is very subtle, suboptimal dosing. So that brings me up to the transforming technology for the war, Warfighter Award. I was uh, fortunate enough to not just receive that funding, but also funding from the USU Pain Research and Man Management uh, funding through Defense Health Agency. Um, Dr. Burns was a co-PI on the USU Pain Research and Man Management funding. And Dr. Bryant uh, was my physiologist for recording. Uh, Dr. Buck and my, or was my uh, MD consultant on uh, battlefield uh, pain control. And uh, Brian Pryor, who was the CEO of Light Cure LLC, but sold that company a year and a half ago, and is now the CEO of BMW Tech, where he has 18 engineers that could build you anything you want in sensors or light de delivery devices. And he's working with me on this project. Um, actually, they all worked on both projects. So being a neuroscience professor, and I want you to understand this so you understand my result. If we look at the ascending somatic sensory system, we have two major pathways. One is the dorsal column medial lenisius pathway, and the other is the spinal thalamic pathway. And the point I want you to remind you of here is that the dorsal column pathway is carrying information such as two-point tactile discrimination, awareness of your body, where your body is, and proprioceptive information, right? Vibration. And it is carrying that information on large myelinated axons, A alpha and A beta. Where the pain and temperature pathways, the sp spinal thalamic pathways, they're carrying information on unmyelinated C fibers or A delta fibers, which are lightly myelinated. And they carry the information on pain and, uh, and thermal reception. So we found throughout this work that we can relate how we affect pain to the dose of our radius. And if we are at 10 to 100 milliwatts per centimeter squared, we can modulate the response by all those things I just told you happen when light goes to mitochondria, okay? So, and we can change the pain response and we've shown this in rat models. But if we go above 200 milliwatts per centimeter squared, we can get a rapid lock of pain transmission and the mechanism is different. So, in these studies, we uh, rely on the spared nerve injury model where you cut and, and ligate two of three branches of the sciatic nerve. You can see the surgery in the microscope and the dermatome patterns of the uh, involved dermatomes. And then we use uh, von Frey. We do a mechanical von Frey to look at um, the changes in, in mechanical allodynia 
And then we have a couple systems when we just invent it using a very, very fine optical fiber to test response to temperature. Um, I just wanted to draw your attention to Dr. Ann Ketz, who is a student here in uh, the School of Graduate Nursing. And uh, Dr. Casper there was uh, her advisor, but I was her research advisor and she did this work in my lab. And she, her work is the one that showed the kinds of responses and the mechanistic basis if you're at the lower irradiances. So I was contacted by some colleagues of mine, uh, Dr. Maria Chavantes uh, at Sao Paulo, Brazil. And she had a student, uh, Dr. Holanda, who is a functional neurosurgeon. And Dr. Holanda was working on a PhD degree. And they had done this little study for back pain. And so uh, it was a, a kind of small pilot where they looked at lidocaine injection, they looked at light treatment, and they looked at ultrasound treatment. And it turns out the ultrasound did the worst of all of them. Um, but in this, uh, her patient population, light was equal to lidocaine at blocking the patient's pain. So she would ask them, you know, and like five minutes later, how are you feeling? And they would say, oh, it's great, you know, basically. And um, it lasted up to 21 days. Now her, she, in, in, in Brazil, most of the manufacturers make these very small kind of uh, less costly devices that so have uh, output power around 150 milliwatts. But what they do is they put it through a very small fiber. And that changes that irradiance because the area is very small to very high. And she had 35 watts per centimeter squared at the end of that fiber, which I don't think you really need that much, but that's what they did. So a lot of companies are interested in just this little study. And so we've been uh, uh, sort of approached by a number of them and kind of establishing what the parameters would be. So Dr. Holanda wanted to work on the mechanistic basis of this. Just watch my time. And um, thank you. And uh, so she came to the lab. One of the things we did was take her laser device down and there happened to be a nicely dissected specimen of the lumbar to uh, dorsal of ganglion, which is huge, it's about this big. Um, and we were measuring the light. She, in her technique, would put it a, a half centimeter away. And we found that we think she was actually delivering four to five milliwatts per, uh, watts per centimeter squared. But anyway, she came and we first did a tissue culture study and we looked at the effects of light um, at 300 milliwatts per centimeter squared. We looked at the effects on uh, mitochondrial metabolism, and we looked at immunocytochemistry. And basically what you can see here in the tissue culture dish was we put the light on and then we of course fix these cells and stain them. But starting at around two seconds, five seconds, we got this lebbing, like rosary bead look, and undulation, uh, morphological changes in the axons. And we didn't, and, and it was specifically related to the small neurons in the culture. Now this was a mixed dorsal root ganglion culture, mixed in sense of it had small neurons and it had large neurons. And so the varicosities, it, in the, uh, if they were smaller than 30 microns, we started to get these changes very quickly. We only started to get uh, changes in the higher uh, neurons, the bigger ones, uh, greater than 30 microns. And that was uh, after two minutes. We also decreased mitochondrial uh, metabolism in all of the settings we tried. Next slide, please. Um, so 
we um, hypothesized, uh, looking at what we found, was that we were just disrupting the microtubules within these neurons with high dose. And so we wanted to try it then in the animal model, which hadn't been looked at. And so we got our, our irradiance measuring fibers and we measured what it would take on the surface of the animal to deliver 300 milliwatts per centimeter squared down to the nerve. And what we found was we needed 10 watts on the surface to deliver that. And when we did deliver it, um, we, of course, the animals were anesthetized, so we couldn't look within five minutes. So we had to wait till they were up and moving around, which was about an hour. And after that one treatment, we looked, tested the heat, and we were able to uh, change the heat levels back to normal and also mechanical, uh, the hyperalgesia but with those pinpricks, but we didn't change mechanical allodynia at all. And so again, it was sort of a reinforcement of that idea that we could selectively affect the small fibers and not affect the large fibers, which is very nice if you wanna do this technique. So under the TTW, uh, we used our sensors. Uh, we were going to look at mixed nerves, pure sensory and, and facial motor nerve. And we looked at what would we need? What kind of output powers uh, to get the irradiances that we wanted? And we wanted to deliver 300, 500 or a thousand um, milliwatts per centimeter squared at the ear. Um, we then did this study because we wanted to see the effect on the motor neurons. You know, if you're going to use something to block pain, it's really nice if you put the light on, if you're not going to take out the motor neuron function. And so that's what we did. We chose to use this uh, facial motor uh, nerve. And this was our recording scheme. Uh, this is with uh, Dr. Bryant. And uh, basically we recorded prior to the light being on, we recorded during irradiation. And then this one scan shows 15 minutes post irradiation. Uh, we went out to about 40 minutes and we didn't have any change uh, in the motor action potentials. Also, we never lost movement of the vibrissa and in sciatic nerve, we never lost uh, reflex motor reflex there. Um, that's what I just said. So basically, one of the other points we wanted to look at, um, talking to Dr. Buckenmeyer and other people, if you want to develop a technique to block pain, say in an austere, austere medical environment or anywhere else, you don't want to do this big scanning, right? You want to have a pinpoint application. So we started looking at what would the differences be if we put, because up to this point, we had been scanning the nerve. Uh, we put the light on the sciatic notch, we put the light on the nerve itself, and we put the light on uh, the dermatome. Yes, and on the dermatome. And the amazing thing was we got the same effect on all of them, even the dermatome, which is something I need to dock. Dr. Darling. <laughs> so in summary, the wavelength with the greatest depth of penetration to deep tissues was A10. We found A10 wavelength parameters can selectively block different size fibers. It's ne not necessary to irradiate the, irradiate, irradiate the entire length of the nerve. And based on other work we've been continuing to do, and I am a co-PI on a grant with engineers at Case Western, um, and that grant is to look at this mechanism of blocking specifically high power. And we're doing that. And we've now determined we need a minimum of seven watts per centimeter squared at the nerve, which means high power on the skin. So it's leading us to come up with a different type of proto type device that will use optical fibers to get through the skin to deliver the light. So, um, 
that's where we're at right now. We proposed to TTW a uh, kind of stepwise multiple phase development of this therapy. Um, and they have, I'm very delighted to say, uh, just uh, a funded phase one. The money's just being transferred now. And I'll be working with uh, Dr. Bryant, whose engineers are going to start on the first tech, the first device. And we are going to be working with a lab in Israel, a pig lab who has a neuropathic pain model uh, to test phase one out. Phase two will be the development of the mobile device itself. This one is kind of, we're gonna have fibers going in um, at multiple sites. Uh, so we get more bang for our, our buck on, on what we're studying. Next one. So I have two more slides and I wanted to add these. They're not the TTW project, but I wanted to add these because so many people at this university have brain injury and disease models. And I, the hottest thing right now in photobiomodulation therapy is transcranial laser therapy. Um, and that's the delivery of infrared laser energy through the tissues of the scalp and skull to target brain regions. And I just wanna let you know that I got it, thank you, that we have done work starting back in about 2000 and trying to think, um, at looking at brain, maybe 2008, uh, we have in the top panels, uh, fresh um, human brain slices and working uh, with this tissue, we found that the brain sulci, the grooves act as light wave guides and the light can get deeper. Um, and I was working with a company through a CRADA that was looking at this first stroke. And they said one of the, the powerful reasons they got a lot of this funding to go ahead was because of this light wave guide. And then I've done a, a much more elegant study with uh, Dr. Clark Tedford and uh, from Seattle and Dr. Steve Jocks, who's a, a very famous light tissue interaction guy. And we had an exquisite um, system uh, that I don't have time to show you, but basically we detected light down to four centimeters within the brain. Um, but that was just photon detection. Uh, there are another, uh, the, the people who were working on the stroke, um, they did mathematical modeling and, and some other types of measurements. Um, and they determined that you can get like 25 millimeters below the dura. And in fact, their stroke study ultimately failed because even though they spent millions of dollars and thousands of animals, they selected criteria for that study, which had huge inclusion, people with multiple strokes, but the real downfall, because they didn't have a good biologist at that time when they set up this treatment, was they included deep brain stroke and cortical stroke. And they didn't hit the p-values they had pre-established at the FDA. On post hoc analysis, if they took out the deep brain, I mean, I'm telling you, this light's going to go two and a half centimeters from any direction, right? Um, but if they took that out, they had hit the p value. Um, but FDA said, well, that's a nice new study for you to raise money for, basically. Yeah. One more slide. So thank you for your attention. And these are uh, my current funding. Thank you, Dr. Anders. Does anyone have any questions? Right here. Well, thank you, Dr. Anders. Uh, uh, actually, for a lifetime of work that has produced a lot of uh, great knowledge. Uh, but I'm going to put you on the spot here. Good. Okay. So um, uh, we had uh, Dr. Ling here just before, and he said that what we've got to do in innovation is ask us what we want. And then he showed us uh, some studies that showed that he had some detectors that could detect uh, uh, blast injury and 
perhaps categorize uh, soldiers uh, in terms of their potential for injury. And uh, uh, Dr. Dugan was here and she talked about a project in which um, you could have early uh, sensors of uh, uh, neurological injury, uh, sensing proteins, mRNA, mRNA, et cetera. So the question is, uh, are we looking at in the future where uh, we can uh, detect significant blast in soldiers and then um, maybe uh, put a light helmet on at 8, 10 nanometers um, to prevent or uh, improve brain injury right away? Um, oh, I'm on. I, I, yes, I think uh, that is definitely one way to go. And I'll tell you this concept of also using sensors to sense either blood, breath, um, a lot of people are interested in, in determining the individual dose that you would apply to a person, right? And so this has been talked about now for some years. Um, I was just asked to be co-PI on one of the photobiomodulation grants, and uh, I'm excited about it for a lot of reasons. And one of the reasons is we're going to be comparing light beds that the military is buying a number of bases. And these light beds, a lot of people use them, right? It's not FDA uh, 510K cleared. I think there may be one that is, but it's cleared under the wellness factor. So it's this general sort of amorphous thing. And so we're getting two different beds, one with a low irradiance and one with higher irradiance. And what we're looking at right now is we have been interviewing sensor companies to look at salivary sensing uh, because the design of the study, we don't want to take blood um, because we'd like to do a crossover study and uh, it, it involves a lot more time. So um, we're looking at various sensors. Uh, Dr. Pry, uh, Pryor, I introduced him to them and right now he's pricing out building a kind of a dummy that we could initially put in the beds and have sensors all over the body. So we could get an idea of what light's getting on there. And then we're looking at sensors also for blood flow and some other things. So hopefully we'll not just be able to make a statement about those beds and if they're effective, but maybe learn something about these sensing and light from this series of experiments. Mm -hmm. uh, but also you see the possibility of uh, using light, um, and I'm, I'm calling it a light helmet, to treat uh, traumatic brain injury early on. Yeah, I, th this last part I brought up, I mean, I could do a whole new seminar on that. I just ran out of time, but um, there is work being done it's small patient numbers. That's, that's one of the drawbacks. But on uh, cognitive changes and aging, on uh, traumatic brain injury, PTSD, um, there's one lab, uh, a woman, she was up at Harvard and she did some studies on NFL football players um, who have cognitive issues. Um, there is a pilot study going on for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. So people are very interested in looking at this whole spectrum. Dr. Anders, thanks for the talk. I'm really looking forward to working with you with photobiomodulation and sleep. Um, I think that the data is really fascinating. Uh, I guess my understanding of the mechanism from the papers published for the C-fiber inhibition is temperature modulation. So uh, one question I have is uh, dose determination and where do we sit with that? Because uh, you could have, you know, potentially overdose and what, what, what other neurons would, would be affected. And so are, are we, are we there yet? Or are we still uh, at the beginning of that? I, I think that if you're talking about light specifically on head, and I, I know you're looking at altering sleep, um, and 
a lot of work has been done and it was all done by the phototherapy people who Brian Cryer, now at B&W Tech, they spun out a new company called Neurothera. Um, and the Neurothera folks have about 24 patents uh, revolved about putting light on the head and they did an enormous amount of work. So I think we have a very good idea of depth of penetration uh, of, of some wavelengths that are gonna work. I, um, the bed study that you'll be uh, guiding us with too is, is interesting. We, this whole body skin exposure will be a, a different uh, ballpark for me and I haven't done that sort of thing. But I think for light on the head, we probably know more than light at other parts of the body. Thanks so much uh, for all the work you've done. I wanted to present you with, a, with the event for a few points. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our last speaker of the day is um, Dr. Tom Darling. He's a professor of dermatology, a professor and chair of dermatology at USU. He received his MD and PhD degrees from Duke University. He completed a medicine internship at UNC Hospitals, a dermatology residency at Duke, and a research fellowship in the dermatology branch of the NCI before joining the faculty of USU in 1999. Um, his laboratory studies hematoma syndromes and skin regeneration. Um, they were the first to demonstrate hair, human hair follicle neogenesis in derma, dermal epidermal composites. Dr. P Darling's presentation is Innovations in Combat and Burn Casualty Care, Next Generation Therapeutic Peptides Promote Wound Repair, Skin and Hair Regeneration. Dr. Darling. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it's a honor to be able to speak to you, to share with you folks today. Um, I am very pleased to uh, be supported by the CCW program. Um, and I'm excited about the results I can share. I'm going to follow the pattern of Dr. Anders Pirates and the Plan for Catch Work and show how that is come out in the CCW. So, never mind. Okay, so all right, so this is 25 year old man who experienced these uh, uh, severe burns on the explosion of mountains in Afghanistan. And at this point, he and getting expert wound care. And because of the expert care, he survived the blast. And he's having um, the healing of the skin. And um, there's not much in the doctor and has good function. But as you can see, there's still rheumatoid disease. And um, so the um, healing from serious burn often results in a lot of skin. So that's the issue that we're trying to address. So one aspect of the treatment is skin grafting. And autologous skin graft, there are several different types. There's the pulsive skin graft, and we use that in dermatology quite frequently because we have pulses on the face, and if the defect is large enough, we need uh, from elsewhere on the body to transfer that. We can grab some behind the ear and keep the particular Try to match it to the skin on the face, and we can do a skin graft. It's 
split thickness draft is uh, the type of draft key which is commonly used in standard assembly in burn uh, you know, peeling burns. And so the uh, slice from the top of the skin is obtained often from the thigh, for example, and it's transferred to the burn area of the body. And the split thickness drafting, you can mesh the drafting. So you can actually expand twofold or threefold compared to the owner. And then more recently, so those technologies have been around for you know, at least 50 years. And then uh, the cellular therapies are more recent. And the idea is that you can take even fewer cells from the body, grow them up, expand them, and graft them into a larger area of the body. So the cell therapy is what I'm going to focus on today. So this is just a brief history of some of these cell therapies. Um, many other investigators are involved. And, uh, but this just gives you a, an idea of some of the different types of cell therapies that have been used. So uh, Green and Reinwald uh, developed the ability to culture keratinocytes, and then they rapidly incorporated this into cultured epithelial autographs that could be drafted to the patient. And this just consists of the epidermal keratinocytes. In 1989, Stephen Boyce at Shriners in Cincinnati, he developed the cultured skin substitutes, where you include not only the keratinocytes, but the fibroblasts, incorporated into a collagen glycosamine glycan sheet. In 1993, Wood and Stoner in Royal Perth Hospital, they developed a technique of spray-on skin. So instead of uh, growing up the cells enough to, uh, uh, enough to form a sheet, you grow up the cells again, but then you spray them on to a much wider area. And this developed, uh, kind of transformed into the recell autologous cell harvesting device where it requires no culture. And uh, this was FDA approved in 2018. So this just gives you an idea of some of these cellular therapies and the approach to help these individuals with burn. The um, variety of tissue engineered substitutes is huge. And this is not even, this doesn't include all of them. It just gives you an idea of some of the products that are out there, acellular products, autologous epidermal, autologous dermal, dermal epidermal composites, which is the area that I'm in, um, both autologous and autograph. So what is the need for innovation? And this was summarized by Dr. Boyce just uh, last month in this, uh, his article that came out. He said, despite these advances, no current alternatives for permanent wound closure restore the anatomy and physiology of uninjured skin. Current alternatives act by mechanisms of wound healing, not by developmental biology by which the skin forms in utero with pigment, hair, sweat, and sebaceous glands, microvasculature, and nerves. When full, full thickness burns are restored with all of the normal structures and functions of uninjured skin, regenerative medicine of skin will remain an ambitious aspiration for future researchers and engineers to achieve. So these are the next frontiers in skin regeneration, are getting these normal structures. And the area that I'm focused on is in the hair follicle. So this, uh, this slide just shows you normal skin versus a scar. And in normal skin, you have the hair follicle there prominently shown in the center, the epidermis, dermis, and subcutaneous tissue with this nice basket weave pattern of the collagen. In the scar, you have loss of those dermal appendages. The collagen's flattened out and uh, uh, parallel to the surface, and you've lost some of the reedy types. So, a lot of the, the defects of a scar are related to these changes. So, the scar is fragile, it's uh, more sensitive to external insults, it heals less well than the original skin. And part of that is related to the hair follicle. Not all of it, but part of it. So let, I want to discuss a little bit more about hair follicle because I'll be discussing some of these uh, anatomic features, but also to talk about the biology. So you have the epidermis uh, going down into the hair follicle, and you can see on the right the sebaceous gland. So that's the oil gland that produces the oils that help maintain the hydration of the skin. They also produce um, antimicrobial peptides that help. 
become worn off passively. Below the sebaceous gland, you have the bulge. That's the repository of the epidermal stem cells for the hair follicle and can be called upon for wound healing. So when you have a scrape, you have this hair follicle that's deeper than the scrape and that hair follicle then becomes the source of the keratinocytes that migrate across the skin, it heals much more rapidly than you would from a full thickness injury where you can only migrate in from the edges. And then you have the dermal sheath and the dermal papilla. And I'll be talking about the dermal papilla cells quite a bit. They're actually just a type of fibroblast that's modified to form right at the base of the hair follicle. And they're important in inducing and controlling hair follicle cycle. I want to mention several people along the way. Len Sperling is who recruited me to use this. And just by coincidence, he's also probably the world's expert in hair pathology. So having him on the team to call whether there's a hair follicle or not in our studies has been very handy. I'm really grateful to have been working with him all these years. So hair follicle formation happens in utero. There's this epithelium and mesenchyme that uh, there's a formation of a placode with these uh, dermal condensate of these cells that then there's these signals between the epithelium and the overlying keratinocytes that form the peg and the bulbous peg. And so the formation of the hair follicles occurs in utero and not in adult life. And that's a problem. When you have full thickness skin loss, how are you going to get the hair follicles back? Now in the adult, there's hair follicle cycling. So everybody knows you can lose hair and regain hair. You're not losing the hair follicle, you're losing the hair shaft, the product of the hair follicle. And the hair follicle goes through this cycle of antigen, catagen, telogen, and then uh, the exogen. And the antigen is where the growth phase and the hair grows. Catagen is involution, and then telogen is the resting phase. So this is the normal hair cycle that hap happens in adulthood but not the regeneration of the original hair. So the current solutions to hair loss are really about stimulating the hair follicles to do what they're supposed to be doing. So when we give someone for male pattern baldness, for example, minoxidil topically or orally, we're trying to move those existing hair follicles that are, have gotten a little small and atretic to beef them up, make them do what they're supposed to do, which is make that hair. The other option is to transplant existing hair from the back of the scalp, say to the top of the head. But this all depends on existing hair follicles and is not generating new hair follicles. So the, the area that many people are working on right now is how do we re-initiate um, this embryonic pathway of hair follicle formation, get new hair follicles, so that the skin can appear and function more uh, normal. My area of research has been looking at this in particular in skin substitute. The way I got into this was a little bit unexpected. I studied hamartoma syndromes. And so hamartomas are um, overgrowths that consist of the cells that are normal to that organ but they're a little bit disordered in uh, um, their arrangement or, um, and there's too much of them. And so it forms an overgrowth. So when I was a uh, fellow at the NIH, there was a syndrome called Proteus syndrome. And I was on the consult service and saw a patient with Proteus syndrome and they have this overgrowth on the sole of the foot so it's called a cerebriform connective tissue nevus. And I contacted Dr. Les Biesecker, who I've now been working with for many years, an NHGRI. And I said, I would like to see more of these patients and be the dermatologist involved with you. And part of the reason I gave at that point was because if we can figure out what's making those cells grow like that, and we can control those signaling pathways that are doing that, that would be really important for skin regeneration. And so, I got interested in that syndrome. And then the next syndrome I got interested in was, was tuberous sclerosis complex, which is another hamartoma syndrome where you develop these benign growths on the skin. These are called angiofibromas. Originally, they were called adenomasebaceum, not really a good name for them, 
but there's something about the hair follicles and the overgrowth in these lesions. And for the, these studies, I worked with Dr. Joel Moss in the NHLBI. So the tuberous sclerosis studies actually turned out to be the more um, productive in terms of the insights in the hair follicle regeneration. And it came about when we tried to develop this xenograft model for tuberous sclerosis skin tumor. And what we, developed, what we did is we used technology that was developed for studying artificial skin, which were these in vitro dermal epidermal constructs or composites. And they, these are made by using the, well, fibroblasts, but in our case, we use the skin hematoma cells, put into type one collagen, and then overline that with normal human neonatal foreskin keratinocytes, allowing that to grow, and then transplanting that to immunodeficient mice. And I want to mention here Jian Wang, who has been working with me for since the time that I got here. And she had a hand in all of the studies that I'm going to present and all the studies we've ever published. And you're very lucky if you can find someone who's an excellent scientist to work with you. But to have an excellent scientist work with you throughout the entire time of your career is just an amazing blessing. So I'm grateful for her work on this study. So uh, the xenograft model, we uh, grafted to the mice, changed the bandage at two weeks, four weeks, monitored the graft size for several weeks, terminate the experiment at 10 to 12 weeks, take off the graft with some surrounding mouse skin, split it in half, half goes for uh, formalized, formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue, and half goes for uh, cryosections. So depending on the type of studies you want to do. So using normal fibroblasts, this is what you see, and it's, it's beautiful. You have this stratified squamous epithelium, overlying this nice formation of the dermis and their basket weave. And these are all human cells on the mouse. And this is exactly what other people observe for decades, but there's no hair follicles. What if you use the hamartoma cells? Well, the hamartoma cells actually induce the hair follicles. And so these tumors on the face of these individuals, these benign overgrowths, actually are involved the hair follicle inducing cells in the face, and they're kind of suspended in this embryonic state. So we're fascinated on, on doing this. This was done by Xiaowei Li, who was with us for many years. And um, just an incredible moment. When I first saw these slides, I was like, oh man, I had what graph because I thought they were um, mouse hair follicles because they're, they're mostly supposed to be hair follicles. And when we realized that these were truly um, you know, human hair follicles. Um, it was just a great moment of celebration. So we, we've studied quite a bit the signaling pathways in tuberous sclerosis and mTOR and how it's involved in controlling these fibroblasts and controlling regeneration. But then the next question was, can we actually do this using normal cells, not cells from some um, overgrowth syndrome? And this was done by Rajesh Thangapazam and uh, Peter Clover, and uh, we um, obtained normal human dermal papilla cells, and then we used the same system and the insights that we gained from using that hematoma syndrome, and, then, and we were able to get uh, the same induction of hair follicles. So um, this, of course, has been very exciting and leading to some patents, but what are, there were some obstacles. Okay, oh, I'm sorry, before I get to the obstacles, just wanna show, here it is published in the, the Journal of Investigative Dermatology right on the cover. And I'm just so um, pleased with the morphology here. On the top is the h &E showing the different features of the uh, hair follicle with the dermal papilla, the outer and inner root sheath, the hair shaft coming up, the sebaceous glands. Uh, we showed in the middle le level, there's uh, human cells by fluorescence in situ hybridization by immunohistochemistry, and the cells are expressing all the uh, markers that would be would express by a hair, human hair cell. But the obstacles then, are, one was the graft survival. So we, the graft take was really good on these mice, but the graft slowly shrink. And, and when we wait too long, the graft will just disappear. Another uh, issue was robust hair follicle formation. We get 
air follicle formation about 80% of the time. We'd like to get it 100% of the time. But then the big challenge was to scaling up. So we're, we're using cells that are very early passage cells. And that's part of the reason it works, okay? Now, that's good enough to graft a mouse. But in order to graft a human and, all, and to get this working human, we need to passage the cells multiple times, expand the cell population. And what happens is when you keep growing the cells, they lose their ability to induce hair follicles. And so we were trying a variety of ways to overcome this technical problem. We tried different types of media. We tried using dermal papillus steroids. We tried different types of collagen. None of this was working. And that's where the uh, TTW program came. So the, the, the TTW program, one of the emphasis, emphases was to try to sp um, spur research and interaction between other institutions. And uh, people came down from Tufts and they, they showed us about um, some of the work going on at Tufts. And one of the investigators was Ira Herman, who had developed these bioactive peptides, okay? Now these bioactive peptides, I wish I had thought of this years ago because when I was a resident, we learned about taking care of chronic wounds. And one of the basic principles was just slap something on a chronic wound if it's not, um, in, if it's not infected, what happens is that the bacterial that are normally colonizing that wound, they go to work and you end up with this goo underneath the dress. Well, that goo actually helps promote the wound healing. And so Dr. Herman figured it out, well, let's figure out what's in that goo. And so he isolated the fragments after degradation by bacterial uh, peptides. And, he, and he, he's, he identified a panel of different peptides and um, if I'm this right. Okay. And he found that they had a variety of in vitro effects. They enhanced cell proliferation, they increased angiogenesis, they stimulated wound healing in vivo, and he had some studies on how they were working and possibly interrupting the cellular receptors and effectors. And so he, he began this program of developing wound healing therapeutics. When I saw that, I was like, well, maybe those peptides are what we need to improve the hair follicle formation. Now, if you want to find out more details about these peptides and how he uh, figured it out, he's a seminar speaker coming up soon. He's coming to the um, MCB seminar series on Thursday, November 10th. So I'll be sure to catch his talk. Okay, so one of my goals then, besides seeing how these would help the graft page and graft survival, was would they help improve the trichogenicity? And the issue was, can we keep growing up these cells long enough to still maintain the ability to form hair follicles? So alkaline phosphatase is expressed by these dermal papilla cells and it's been used as a marker of trichogenicity. And so when you look, when you grow the early passage dermal papilla cells, you have high alkaline phosphatase, those induce hair follicles. Later passage, they're not trichogenic, they lose alkaline phosphatase. And so the question was, can we use this marker, screen these different peptides, because we had like 20 of them, and find out which one may increase the uh, alkaline phosphatase activity. So that's what we did. And in screening these peptides, we would compare scrambled peptides, so same amino acids, but just a different sequence, and the active peptide. And we found one peptide that stimulated alkaline phosphatase activity, not a huge amount, but it was very encouraging that there was a change in alkaline phosphatase activity. So this prompted us to use this hair follicle reconstitution or patch assay. So the patch assay, we take the human dermal papilla cells, we need to make them into a steroid to work in this patch assay. And then we inject them um, just below the mouse skin and uh, using a combination of peptide, human dermal papilla steroids, and fresh mouse epidermal cells, after three weeks, you get hair follicle formation. And you can just count the number of hair follicles. So what does this peptide do in the hair follicle assay? The scrambled versus the active, there's this two-fold stimulation of hair follicle uh, formation with this one peptide. So then we can move on to the next step, which is even more difficult, which is the cultured skin substitute and see 
what effect they would have on your skin substance. Okay, so if a vehicle or a scrambled peptide or active peptide incorporated them just as before, and the dermal papilla cells now we're using are passage eight. We usually we use like passage three or four. So now let's passage them out to passage eight. Would not expect to get many fair follicles to form at all and see if the peptide then can have uh, an effect on fair follicle formation. And sure enough, scrambled peptide, no hair follicles or very few hair follicles, active peptide, beautiful hair follicle formation with a scrambled peptide. And this is a cryo section stained with human leukocyte antigen. So you can see the red stain indicating that these are human cells and human hair follicles. So summarizing our data using this peptide, we looked at graph survival. And uh, you can see with active peptide, 14 mice grafted all survived. In the scrambled in vehicle, we had three grafts that did not persist all the way to the end. They, came, they, they were there at four weeks, so it was good graft take, but they uh, shrunk and went away. Okay. Presence of fair follicles, yes or no? Um, active peptide, 12 mice out of 14 had hair follicles. Scrambled peptide and vehicle, only about 50% of mice had any hair follicles. What about the number of hair follicles in the mice? So, just in one, in the two sections of the mouse, uh, we have about five in the active peptide and, and a median of zero in the scrambled and the vehicle. So, the no question about how this peptide is stimulating health, hair follicle formation. So the Tufts peptide then promotes this formation of uh, new hair follicles in these skin composites. And again, so we have promotion of new hair follicle formation. It does not require a uh, donor hair. So where are we going from that? Okay. So um, we're, we, we're, we have three major uh, uh, different arms now. We wanted to see how about in the burn model. So in USA ISR, um, uh, Kusto and Nutrilla working with a swine mo burn model because uh, the, the burns are what we want to see if these will be able to preserve the hair follicles following burn. Radiation dermatitis, and hair, everybody's aware of hair loss following radiation. We're working with uh, Regina Day and Julian Kang in uh, pharmacology and APRI in this uh, radiation model for the effects of the peptide there. And then finally, bioprinting. So we had already started working with 4D BioCube and Vince Ho's group, and we're able to bioprint the skin now. And so now we're incorporating the peptides into the bioprinting. So what's the next 50 years of innovation? Well, the goal, of, of course, is we want to have this skin to look just like normal appearing skin. Now, I'm not going to be around 50 years from now, but what I do hope is that we get some advance with the uh, air follicles forming in the, in the skin, and I hope that the peptides will be part of the uh, management of these patients and help them to have more normal skin regeneration. I have several slides of uh, acknowledgement. So within our department, um, many of these people I mentioned already, I want to highlight Donald Aduba and Sandy Xavier, who are working with us uh, now on this project. Also, um, Maria Vocal and Leonore McKay handling all the administrative stuff. Thank you very much. Next slide. Uh, Ira Herman at Tufts, of course, and his uh, notable invention. The investigators at USAISR that uh, manages the TTW program. Uh, pharmacology, AFRI, 4D BioCube, the PMB statistics, the USU sequencing core, we're going to begin using that to try to investigate the uh, mechanisms of action. And uh, over at Walter Reed, we obtained the neonatal foreskin, uh, Dr. Greenwald helped us with that. Next slide, the funding, the TTW program, other sources of funding that are sponsoring this research. Thank you very much. Questions? Just one. 
Thanks very much. Uh, that's wonderful research. Um, I remember um, uh, hearing a group, I think they were from uh, Boston, and they were working with uh, uh, harvesting micro columns of, uh, uh, of skin. Um, and then interestingly enough, originally they were trying to arrange them and then they realized that sometimes they couldn't, they could just sort of spray it on. I, I, that's probably the, the wrong term, but they could just uh, layer it on and they would get regeneration of skin with hair follicles. What's your experience with that? And what do you think of those techniques? Yeah, so that, that's a fantastic um, approach. I was done at Wellman. And then, um, so actually down in USA ISR, uh, Cristo is gonna be using that with our peptides. And so what we wanna do in the porcine model is to try that same thing, make those columns put them in there and see if the peptides enhances the uh, retention of those uh, cap capabilities of forming normal skin, normal again skin. Yeah. That's really exciting work. Uh, congratulations on your progress, sir. I'm interested to know about the peptide stability and uh, its mode of penetration. For example, is it expected to be um, applied to intact skin or is it really need to be uh, kind of permeated into uh, you know stem cells or something like that yeah, so um, these peptides would not penetrate intact skin um, whether they would have enough effect on the hair follicle I'm sure somebody will try to stick it in shampoo or something like that yeah. but um, right now the plan is for um, using it either injected or on wounded skin. <laughs> Any other questions? Dr. Bell, and again, I want to thank you for uh, you know this wonderful lecture uh, and uh, the superb work uh, in terms of really uh, treating difficult problems in warfighters uh, with uh, burns and, and the like. Uh, that makes a difference in mm -hmm. their lives, uh, their functional lives, their uh, mental health, and how they, um, you know just can uh, assist and contribute to life. So thank you very much. I want to present you with the 50th thank anniversary you, car, uh, coin for this superb life. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank <laughs> you.